OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, bang on half past seven. It is a Thursday morning, I want to say. I'm getting a vigorous shake of the head there from uh, Colm and Jojo in the box. A very good morning to you. Um, schools are back. Mechanic Cup is back. The Premier League is back. It's almost like the World Cup never happened, folks. You'd forget about it fairly quickly, wouldn't you? I mean, Messi lifting the World Cup feels like a, a lifetime ago now that the Mechanic Cup is back. I mean, the priorities take over. Greater things take over. That's it. We've had the darts and now the Mechanic Cup. Who's Messi who? who? And have you forgotten the darts yet? Uh, no, not just yet. The greatest thing you've ever seen in your entire life. Are you like coming off that the, the uh, afterglow of that and going... Well, you know, maybe some other good stuff happened in my life. I did, but but I'm still on a buzz. I'm still on a high. Are you, Richie yeah. McCormick was on the same high last night listening to him. He, uh, I think darts is one of those sports, I was thinking about this last night, there is such a great divide between people who like darts and people... There's no one who kind of likes darts. You either love darts or you think it's a load of crap. I, I, I mean, look, I don't think it's a load of crap. I, I, but you're not in... You, you know, people who aren't into it per se. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've had this conversation. Yeah. It's okay. You, you don't, we don't need... Yeah. Cameron, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Yeah. Hi. I was really getting into the darts as it went on. Mm. So I wouldn't have been the biggest darts fan before. And then you're like, as you say, Shane, there's a real ASMR thing about the dart hitting 100%. the court. 100%. It's beautiful. And if you're good at maths, it, it helps your brain to kind of quickly Does it, yeah, up. You, know, you and Sunny Rishak. Yeah, yeah. Work out where the checkouts are, etc. I'm terrible at maths, so uh, I, I struggle with that aspect oh, of I it. I thought that would have been right up your street as, yeah. uh, as a, a resident geek. More of a history. and I, I like science and space, but um, yeah, I wouldn't have made it as an astronaut necessarily. No, sure, there's no maths in space or anything. No, no, no. You don't need no, to add any, no, any numbers up. No, it's fine. Just guess where the moon is and point the rocket up. And there was pic- pictures of you doing the rounds on social media yesterday. Was there a, 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 an astronaut death? Oh, there was an astronaut death. Walt Cunningham. It was yeah. A, yeah, a Apollo 7 astronaut. Very sad news. He was, he was 90. You looked about 12 in the photograph. I, I looked, a lot of people have pointed that out to me. <clears throat> Send me the photo going, who is this? It, I, I was 19. I, I wasn't even 20. So it's a, it's a while ago. But um, yeah, yeah, sad news. I interviewed him in 2013 and uh, yeah, I just heard the news yesterday. So. so you interviewed him as a 19-year-old? Yeah, I was writing for the college newspaper in UCD. Right. And uh, used that position to sneak interviews with astronauts so flew, flew over to Birmingham this is the guise in which I managed to uh, ah, worm my way into Buzz Aldrin's life you got to do what you got to do and you weren't you weren't there when he punched the, the lads I wasn't there and uh, he didn't punch me thankfully because uh, Buzz, Buzz, Buzz probably could have made it as a, as a boxer if he, if he hadn't been an astronaut the way, the way he hit that guy but he did say the moon landings didn't happen to a guy who walked on the moon so a punch that was deserved he probably, he probably did deserve but what was coming his way. Anyway, um, uh, Cameron, you're here because we're, we're breaking news about you and your, your character this morning. It says uh-huh. a lot about a man that he is a, a Leeds United fan. Yeah, yeah, uh, for my sins. From Mayo. Um, How have we not known this? Before? I don't know. You kinda, you're kind of you obviously a bit shamed. I keep a tight lid on my personal life. I try um, not to reveal my age, for instance. Mm. And uh, yeah, I keep a tight lid on, you know, people hear, oh, he's a Leeds United fan. I don't go around saying I'm the Leeds United fan, Cameron Hill, because I think that colours people's perception of you. Has a ring to it though. So we don't know your age either, that's a good point. Well, you're the only young Leeds United fan that yes. I know. I mean, it's kind of, which would suggest that like your, your agelessness, uh, you're actually in your 40s. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very well preserved. Yeah, the, the, the air over in... The beard makes sense though. It's, it's, it's all that, you know how um, when you find all these ancient bodies in the bog and they're perfectly preserved. That's what we Not do. Not personally, but yeah. yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're yeah. famous. Yeah. Oh, no, I personally haven't found any in the bog. But, okay. But I, yeah, I do no, know. No, no, no. You, you, but when well, you, you leave them up there in my <laughs> Isn't that what Salon Jukes would yeah, have dan- us believe? Dangerous people up there at yeah. the border, yeah. But yeah I see, yeah. apologise yeah. for that, though, just in case anybody missed the apology, of course, because <laughs> yeah, it's high profile, obviously. Sorry, Cameron, we got way late. How the hell did you become a Leeds fan? Uh, Why? As many Leeds fans my age, it's through your father. So my dad was a Leeds fan because he grew up in the Giles era. And you kind of just inherit that. Um, My brother's a Leeds fan too. And then my other brothers are Arsenal fans and no fans at all because they don't really like football. Right. Um, But yeah, I kind of, I was kind of a passive Leeds fan because I started following football the year they went down and everything went to pot. And then when they got back into the championship, I got into them again and really got into them with Bielsa. I think that was the ignition for my current interest in Leeds. Fair enough. I think Bielsa is a a good enough excuse for anybody. Mm. Um, And is is your brother who ratted you out as the cheat in the quiz, is he the one who doesn't like football? No, he's the the Leeds fan as well. So I'm the kind of clean 
nice silky football leads and he's the dirty lead. I don't think any cheaters are clean. Cain and Abel is the, the thing that comes to mind here yeah. for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were playing last night against West Ham. A good opportunity for them to get three points, you would have thought. West Ham in a bit of crisis at the moment. The um, Their co-owner or chair um, died yesterday and uh, apparently West Ham weren't bad or were they awful and good in about a 10-minute period? Yeah, I suppose... It was a game that I was disappointed Leeds didn't come away with three points from because they were excellent in patches. Um, that new player, Nanto, is fantastic. Yeah. and got a great, He got his first goal and got a great goal. Um, and you thought, okay, Leeds are really dominating this and dominated a large part of the game. But it's one of those with Leeds where it's the small uh, moments of just mistakes that end up costing them badly. Like the, there's obviously the penalty, and it was a penalty. Um, West Ham player was completely bundled over and then Aronson straight after the break um, does this terrible pass back and Scamacci latches onto it and scores a screamer from outside the box and you're just like oh it's the story of Leeds all this good work we've done and then it's all undone completely um, either side of the break but then they got back through Rodrigo who I think is a brilliant Rafinha replacement well yeah. he's been there since Rafinha's been there but he's been absolutely sensational but I think that game was class it was really really exciting it was really on edge especially in the last 10 minutes when you felt Leeds could win and Rodrigo nearly oh nearly got it but for a save from Fabianski but it was a good tight affair I just they're the types of games you really need to win yeah, yeah. to stay up it's Villa away next for Leeds yeah tough game uh, but very you, tough you, you see Leeds on New Year's Eve drawn away to Newcastle and you're thinking well this is a decent team no, not many people get anything out of Newcastle away at the moment um, mm. uh, Jesse Marsh I think he was he quoted the other day saying his job was so stressful he, yeah. cer he certainly has one of the more stressful jobs in the Premier League because you you expect goals at Ellen Road but that brings with it some heart rate issues you'd imagine for definitely a and whatever game they're in, involved in they're always box office I, yeah. mean, I think back to last year that 3-2 win away to Wolves which ultimately saved us really um, from going down that was Absolutely brilliant. We went 2-0 behind and just stormed back. And I think Jack Harrison needs to be more involved in the midfield. I don't really rate Somerville. He was very lucky to get You don't rate him, no? Not really. No, I think he was lucky not to get sent off yesterday. It was a really was bad on tackle line. on Soufell. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think Harrison just has a bit more attacking flair. Uh, he links up really well with Rodrigo, as was evidenced in the goal that brought us back into the game. But... Um, yeah, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. It's only a kid though, Somerville, isn't he? Yeah, like he that's, got the goal yeah, against They're a very young side. Yeah. Do you want Do you want Jesse Marsh to stay? Do kind of. I'm growing. He's growing on me. I was kind of a little bit embarrassed, not by his Americanness. I don't really care one way or the other where managers from, but his sort of pitch side antics are kind of wear thin an awful lot of the time. Like just constantly giving out to the fourth official is fine when you know. I suppose when you're winning, it's like, ah, oh, classic. But when you're losing, it's a little bit embarrassing. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm warming to him. I think he's kind of playing that Bielsa washbuckling sort of style mm. and bringing, maybe not bringing it on hugely, but I think with the right players, if they sign really well in January and in the summer, um, there, there are the makings of something really special there. They've got loads of, uh, and they seem to have a f fairly good scouting network. They are picking up players who are managing to make it in the Premier League relatively quickly. Um, and I think they're going to be taken over by the same ownership group as the San Francisco 49ers in the summer fully. That seems like that's all on the cards too. So, like, there should be long term investment. And there are probably are three worse teams than them in the Premier League at the moment. Yeah. That's, that's what will save them. Absolutely. And uh, I just think if we kind of had more confidence in defence, we could we could um, bolster our survival credentials. I think we have enough to stay up this year, but, you know, I don't want to be the Newcastle of the Mike Ashley I'm year fasted. where you're just I, surviving. I'd be very curious if there are any Leeds fans your age, and clearly we don't know your age, Cameron, but I'd be curious to see if there are any Leeds fans your age out there in Ireland at the moment whose parents didn't support Leeds. Like, yeah, I, I understand it being passed down from generation to generation. That makes sense. But how do you pick up supporting Leeds now? Maybe the style of play... Bielsa, I think, would have been. Bielsa like, probably been. You know, but then, obviously, he's gone now, so <laughs> you're like, oh, that was... Uh, I, when we were kids, there were um, Chevy Wednesday fans in town, and, like, yeah, they, they, they stopped liking football, basically. <laughs> <laughs> they gave up. Well, how did you start supporting Villa? 
Paul McGrath went over ah, to watch. Ah, that's fair. Right, yeah, yeah. Went over yeah, to watch yeah. Paul McGrath play football, and it was um, he had Gary Lineker in his pocket. Lineker got taken off after an hour. Dilla one three two. I was like, oh, this guy's the rest is history. Oh, there was actually somebody walking around with God four on the back of his jersey, and like, ah, makes sense. Way before Robbie Fowler was ever called God, there was a previous God. There was only one God. Yeah. Um, it's 7.40 this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, let's hear from you. 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. We have our Italian 90, World, World Cup 90 uh, binder out this morning because Toto Scalacci is coming in a little bit later on. Toto Scalacci not in the um, sticker book for, this was Orbis, not Panini, for whatever reason, they must have got the rights to it. Mm. Um, he's actually over launching a sticker exhibition that's on uh, in Dublin it was on in Cork uh, before Christmas so we'll talk to him a little bit later on through his interpreter but he's not even in the he was such a late bolter for the Italian 90 squad that he didn't get a a, a sticker having said that Roberto Baggio didn't get a sticker either Mancini and Viali Donadoni Fernando Di Napoli and a few others uh, all got stickers a few randomers got stickers yeah um and Paolo Maldini, age 22. Uh, the, the implication here is that he's only in the, in the team because he's the son of Cesare Maldini. Uh, Cesare Maldini. Maldini. Exactly. Mm. As Elio Vicini's assistant manager. It's like, um, maybe he's in it because he's like the greatest defender in the world I've ever seen. He's class, yeah. Um, That's so funny. Like, he, he, there, there can't be many examples of like um, Toto going on to win the golden boot and the golden ball, and yet he's not in the official sticker book. Did he win the golden ball as well? Golden ball as well. Did he? Player of the tournament and top goal scorer. For Italian ID. Really? And they got the semi finals only. I mean, am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah. Well, player of the tournament as well as top goal scorer. Fair play. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> Do you feel like maybe Lothar Mateus might have had a, a claim? Anyway, yeah. uh, Carlo Ancelotti, midfield, age 30, AC Milan, previously with Parma and Roma, disciplined player whose career has been dogged by injuries. And then went on to become, you know, the Italian Big Sam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, essentially. That's mad. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a, it's a strange one meeting Toad. I'm excited to meet him. But, uh, he broke so many Irish hearts. I was actually trying to Google there, the English to Italian. Hi, Rovinato, i nostri sogni, apparently, is the Italian for you ruined our dreams. I'm not sure whether I'm going to say that to him straight away or at the end, but... Yeah. Give us again. Hi, Rovinato, i nostri sogni. Now, that is you Google are. Translate, so I could be telling him his spaghetti tastes fantastic. I don't know what it is about Italian and a Monaghan accent, but I'm, I'm here for There's it. something about it. Oh, you know? that was beautiful. Yeah, 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 we have something in common. But you ruined our dreams. I don't know if that's the way to, to start the chat with Toto, but maybe I'll, I'll get there eventually. It wasn't exactly a Thierry Henry, you ruined our dreams. You didn't cheat, like a, a la Cameron Hill in the crappy quiz. You just scored a goal to, to essentially break our hearts. Uh, he's a name that, that still resonates for a lot of people in, in this country. Here's what's coming up between now and 10. Toto's going to be in around about uh, 20 past 9. At 5 past 8, we're going to talk with Jasmine Baba about Everton and Evan Ferguson. Uh, we have Around the World with Shane Hannon coming your way at 25 minutes past 8. Uh, 8.45 with John Duggan. 1JD, please. There you go. Deal or no deal? The uh, first one on this transfer window coming your way at 5 past 9 and um, some football show highlights from 9.35 this morning. Now, Shane, big news really from uh, overnight is that um, football is back. Vinnie Corey made his debut as the uh, Monaghan manager. Was it a successful one? Uh, I wouldn't, not, not in terms of the result. Lost by four points to down, 210 to 12 points in Castle Blaney last night. Um, paid my 12 euro to watch the stream. I have to say, impressed by Ulster TV, Ulster GA TV. They, so you, you pay 12 quid for the stream. You can, get, you can buy a McKenna Cup membership for 30 euro where you get all the games. So, of course, if your your county plays two group games, you get to a semi-final and a final, it becomes worth it. But uh, the, the stream you, setup you, was brilliant. You the single stream, did you? the single stream. I wasn't too confident. I was like, nah, we'll leave it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they had the scoreboard, they had the um, the commentary team as well. Picture was brilliant. Felt like I was in Castle Blaney last night. Didn't even have to drive up. But um, glad to see it back. You're kind of scouting. You feel, like, you feel like you can go home now with your head held high and have the, the conversation in the pubs and discuss the players that, that are breaking through. Uh, a colleague of ours, who shall remain nameless, Tommy, um, suggested that he thought that there was a chance that Wicklow were going to beat the Dubs last night. That uh, Oshin McConville was going to get his debut win and then, obviously, the Dubs... Um, Thrashed them. Whatever team it was. BC, experimental, developmental team. Um, so the the strength and depth that we're always... Oh, I don't really have that much when they're going looking for it. They've got plenty, it turns out. Now, OK, it's Wicklow. But it was in Wicklow. Um, and it was Oshin McConville's first game. So they won that one. Um, we had uh, Colin O'Rourke making his debut mm -hmm. um, a, a, a scrappy win against Carlo um, Caldera winners last night big, big win as well the big story I think is 
Uh, Cork picked a strong team. Kerry picked a not weak team, like not a not a nothing team, right? Yeah, but it's only three of the Ireland finalists. Still, they had they had like some yeah. players who were there. Um, Pictures of Darren Moynihan. Um, uh, I think it ended up with four or five. Actually, got some game time minutes, and they conceded five goals. As was it, Colin pointed out? Were you pointing out? Who pointed out that they've Colum. conceded more goals overnight uh, in than last season? Yeah. Oh, it was Colin. Let's give him his dues. <laughs> well, of course he's going to bring that up. Both finals, of course, it was five eleven to fourteen points. There's not many times in any game. I don't care if it's McGrath Cup to Kerry concede five goals. It's over. The dream is over, lads. I'd love to see the Kerry Mafia WhatsApp group this morning complaining about the. Um, the start of the season and how they were a flash in the pan I can't believe that they've done this yeah. to us uh, Colin McCallaghan 2-4 from midfield for Cork as well uh, top performance for him but um, yeah I, like Cork a lot of money has been pumped into Cork football and hurling over the last few years but it has to come to fruition in the next next couple of years you'd imagine I'm not saying they're going to go out and win a Munster football title very soon we just want them to be competitive we want Kerry to have a game before yeah. the All-Ireland series mm. like yeah. Which hasn't happened in quite a significant period of time. I know they beat them in that COVID year with the free goal at the end, but I'd like to see it on a more consistent basis. Yeah, it could be a, a tight fixture in summertime. Let's yeah, see, let's see what happens in, in in summertime. But look, fair play. It's they're up and running, and I think um, Cork on a bit of a roll would be good. Uh, the league is going to be pretty interesting this year. Mm. There's like a, <laughs> there's a because of the way the crappy provincial system automatically puts the finalists through to the All Ireland series. There's going to be a Division 3 team in the All-Ireland Series who more than likely will get absolutely annihilated in all the big games that they're playing. But anyway, that might be the the outcome for it. But it also means that some good teams, <coughs> by virtue of them um, finishing in Division 2 down the, the pecking order, won't be in the race for Sam Maguire. And again, the knock-on impact of that, folks, by the way, is that they're going to be in the Talton Cup and it's going to be really easy for them to win the Talton Cup so you don't actually get the benefit of having a team coming from one of the lower divisions to win the Talton Cup. That's my prediction. I'm just, mm. you know, I could be wrong. Maybe uh, one of those Division 2 teams who drops down to the Talton Cup won't put out their strongest team, won't care about it, won't really celebrate the way that Westmead did because like, oh, what a great achievement. We won the Tier 2 competition even though we were actually <laughs> consider ourselves a Tier 1 team. Yeah. So the law of unintended consequences is going to be in full view all summer long. I'm looking forward to seeing how it pans out. The whole, but but I like the fact that it's so condensed, and that's probably given. And a lot of people have said this in recent days, given a bit of impetus now to the preseason competitions, where people are like, you kind of have to be playing well now to be in the league team. If you're in the league team, you're in the championship team. So there's a knock-on effect um, in these preseason competitions, and then the players like Conor McManus who are, actually given it one more year because it's so condensed. I do think as well that um, the league is more important now because of your positioning and the impact that that might have in the championship, but ultimately. Uh, the provincial competitions are are less important. Uh, you know, if you are already guaranteed, if you finish, if you finish in the top two in Division Two, you're guaranteed to be in yeah. the um, Sam Maguire uh, competition. So, um, like, what you know, why would you bother then caring about what happens in the provincial? But isn't there still a novelty in winning your province, uh, 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 having uh, the medals in the back pocket when you're tired in Leinster? You know, well, Leinster's not going to happen for anyone right, but the Dubs. Yeah. But in Ulster, the Province has probably never been as competitive as, as it is now. Like yeah, yeah, any number of five, six teams can win it. Maybe. Well, Donegal, Tyrone. Derry, I don't think Donegal Arma. can win it. I no, think, not this season. Don't think Donegal are going to win it this season. Um, Tyrone will be back. Derry, Armagh, guaranteed to be there. Um, okay, that's three. Monaghan might have a say. Could they win it? Uh, you, never, you never know. They could win. They could win. I'm not, I'm not writing them off, but no. I'm saying that I, I would have them as. The big outsiders. Well, Derry and Armagh are the heavy favourites. So I've got three teams. You've got three teams. Yeah. Same as it ever was. I don't know. <laughs> I think. I think. Uh, sure. Little. Old, little. Little old Calvin hopped in a few years ago. And and well, yeah. Off, exactly. In in the in the summertime. Let's see. Let's see. Calvin do it when the when the weather's good. Mm. Can they do it on a, a fine hot day in Clonus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe not. Uh, Cameron Mayo. You're also it's a, a cursed combination of Mayo and Leeds. Yeah. What yeah. do you expect from the Mayo footballers this year? All Ireland glory? Uh, no, unfortunately not. I, no, I can on. dream of it, but I, I don't know. It seems it's like not the response a Mayo fan should ever have. Uh, sorry, Mayo fans. I think we're gonna have but we're gonna have a really good run. I think we might. I think we might get to a final, depending on how it. Uh, but if you're in a final, you could you could win it. Well, that's it. Um, I just you know my heart's been broken far too many times. I'm like one of those Hurricane Katrina dogs who doesn't let them be petted anymore. Um, <laughs> The no, I think it's a like. There's a lot of players returning. Obviously, uh, we don't know about Lee Keegan yet. We will find out um, imminently. But uh, 
Paddy Durkin is coming back this year. Jason Doherty, Kevin McLaughlin, those are huge players to have back in the side. Oshin Mullins a big blow though. He is a big blow. That's a and big, that's my big blow. Big concern is that the Mayo defense is kind of looking a bit bare bones. You never know who's going to come through, and uh, um, you do, yeah, you don't know who's going to come through. That's the back. thing. That's the advantage of a new manager. Like I even watching the Monaghan team last night, although they lost, there's some new players that Vinnie Corey has clearly found, and he spoke about Ashley with that about that after mm. the match, finding new players and how they've gone about that. Same for Kevin McStay. He's going to be finding new players that people haven't heard of, but that are. And these don't have to be 19, 20 year olds. You can find someone who's 26, 27 in their prime playing really good club football who hasn't been involved uh, yet. Yeah. I think Mayo and Kevin McStay will be excellent. And that's it. That. And it's a really deep player pool in Mayo at the moment because it is one of the more competitive club football championships. Mm. Um, They've had loads of unraged teams over the last 10, 15 years where some of those players will be late bloomers. And famously, Mayo have had a lot of late bloomers who've gone on to win three or four All Stars in a row. So. Absolutely. Um, I'd love this year to have a kind of clean bill of health. I think we were very unlucky with injuries, with Tommy Conroy being the most prominent one last year. Mm. Um, but even Killian wasn't fully fit. Yeah. Like that, you know, he, he'd come back from an injury that in other sports takes way longer to come back. And um, so you would hope that he's had a full off season and a full pre season and that um, he's able to get to the level of athleticism that we yeah, know he's capable of. And then, yeah. you know. I do feel he was rushed in. He kind of had a bit of a Harry Kane Champions League final type mm. performance last year throughout the season. But um, they played the challenge match against Sligo uh, earlier or in the last couple of days and some main starters, Matty Ruan, Jordan Flynn, James Carr are all involved. It was by all accounts a really good game. I didn't get to see it. but um, Big win though. What, 11 points? 11 points, exactly. Um, so Galway are the kingpins of Comet now, Cameron. Th they mm. are and accept, you have to accept it well yeah uh, they are an incredible team and obviously you know the calibre of talent in that front line but Connacht doesn't matter the two, the two of those now they've got eyes on bigger prizes mm. well they're all on that side go away <laughs> go play Mayo in the <laughs> yeah. quarter final and the winner plays Ro the Rossies in the semi that's the that's the whole balls of this draw and the way it's worked out but fair play to the, the lowly team in Connacht who gets to that provincial final it's an experience for them I yeah, it is, and then and then they'll get hammered in the three games yeah. afterwards in the Sam Maguire, and they won't have the opportunity to win something. When you know, so you have this great season where you build and build and build. Yeah. you get hammered in the Connacht final, and then you get hammered and you get hammered and you get hammered again. And it's like, what was the point of that, lads? But maybe maybe they have one good game against a team. Yeah, in in the Sam Maguire, I don't know. I just think that it's like it's not actually helping those counties to progress to a level where they have a realistic dream of winning something because they've no chance of winning Connacht mm. in that Connacht final. Whoever comes through on that side will be 10 to 15 point underdogs yeah. for that final. Anyway. One of these years we'll get it right. Um, and we won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the news came through after we were off air yesterday that the Ben Healy move to Edinburgh is a done deal. We had kind of been speculating about the, the prospect of that and uh, what this actually means for our rugby, what it means for Ben Healy, what it means for Scotland. So it's going to be Cooney and Healy, no doubt the way things work in the uh, World Cup Suddenly that Ireland-Scotland game takes on a little bit of uh, extra relevance for us. I mean, fair play to Ben Healy if he makes the Scotland uh, team for the World Cup. That would be a meteoric rise. Mm. Um, if he does get it into the Scotland team that quickly, you'd have to go, do, do they know something we don't or do we know something they don't? That's, <laughs> that's what's going to be this great sliding doors moment for Ben Healy's career for the rest of it um, as he goes and gets straight into the Scotland squad. But um, Cameron, you've been looking at some of the other Irish players abroad? Well, that's it. I mean, I think um, just on Healy, we were talking about it yesterday um, at post in our post show meeting, and I was kind of I speculated that maybe Ben Healy looked at the way fly halves are sort of treated media wise in this country and said, you know what, maybe that's not for me. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it sort of feels like there's a. What do you mean? It sort of feels like every time a fly half that isn't Johnny Sexton plays for Ireland, there's this inquisitional mania. Where it, if they have a um, a good game, they're as Keith would said, the second coming of Christ. Um, if they have a bad game, it's ah, oh, we're never going to replace them, are we? We're never going to find a an understudy to Sexton, and you know that kind of that's just Irish sports fans generally. Yeah, they get but, carried away. It, well, exactly, and maybe Ben Healy goes. I could go to Scotland, where I mean, not to diss Scottish rugby, the. <laughs> The expectations are a little bit lower. That they're given a little bit more of a free reign. Um, like they, 
despite disciplinary issues, they've let Finn Russell back into the squad, or Gregor Townsend is, I don't know how many times at this stage. Um, maybe he would prefer more of a forgiving rugby culture like that. I'd, I'd say we feel it's forgiving. I suspect if you're living in Edinburgh and listening to BBC Radio Scotland or Radio Clyde and they're talking about the Scottish out half, it feels less forgiving. Now, I don't know. You're right. Expectations are much lower. This is not a team or a country that has produced successful club sides or international teams at any point since the professional era started. So, you know, if you go over and all of a sudden you bring some success, then you are the new messiah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I, the thing about the out half position is that, like, it's it's a quarterback, and in Irish rugby, there's been that uh, fascination slash fixation slash fetish around the ten, all the way back to uh, Tony Ward, that kind of period of time, which is the seventies. So, that's the ball game, but the upside for that is that if you climb to the top of the tree, you're the natural successor to O'Gara who is a legend, to Sexton, who was a world player of the year. And so that's the prize that was on offer. And Ben Healy has turned around and said, I don't want that. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. I don't think I'm going to be able to beat out the competition in Munster. And I don't think I'm going to be able to beat out the competition in Ireland. And you know what? Fair enough. Because as Keith Wood said, the, the career is short. But if, you, if you're not backing yourself to do that, then that's fine. And I think like Irish rugby can, can certainly beat itself up about a lost talent or can say well that's okay if somebody decides they don't want to be part of what it takes for us to get to the top then that's okay because that kind of signifies to us that you're not going to do the work that we need you to do to get to the top maybe it's not a playing thing maybe he hasn't looked at the situation Healy and gone I'm not going to get there so let's move on maybe he just considers himself as Keith said yesterday he might consider himself more Scottish than Irish and his plan all along was to play for Scotland like and if that's the case Fair play to him. He, he mightn't be looking at the situation in the Irish playoffs and, and, and you know, uh, judging off that whether or not he's going to play for Ireland and keep going with Munster. But do you think if he was the Munster starting at half, he would have said, I feel more Scottish than Irish? Maybe still. Maybe. Maybe his upbringing was leaning slightly more towards the Scottish end of things than the Irish end of things. Oh, yeah. And that was think, his plan all along. I think it's an entirely self-interested move. That's, that's what he's doing it for. I mean, you talk about the, the cult of the ten in Irish rugby, and I was only looking just on the way in today, just out of curiosity, has Johnny Sexton ever played for the Barbarians? Because obviously that's such a big um, feather to have in your cap in terms yeah. of your international rugby CV, and he hasn't, and neither is O'Gara. And I thought that, that was like indicative of the wider maybe concern for Healy, is that when you are the Ireland number one, that is your life. You are that for the next, I don't know, however many years of your career. And maybe, you know, maybe he was like, there might be more to life than just being, whenever you're free for Ireland, that's it. Your, your okay. regime, your regimen and your schedule is totally set to the clock of the Irish rugby calendar. Well, there is, there is Johnny Sexton's longevity as well. I think a lot of those players underneath him in the, in the 10 situation weren't expecting him to still be playing at this point. No. If they, if they thought four years ago that Johnny Sexton would still be playing at this World Cup, they'd be like, nah, he won't be playing at the level if he is still playing. Uh, but it turns out he's still one of the best tens in the world at 37 years of age and who knows how much longer he can go on no this is it now you think so yeah this is it <laughs> this is it we should enjoy this because it, it like so maybe he wants to go on to the next Lions tour I don't know but like there's a chance he don't get picked now who knows maybe the next Lions tour is Andy Farrell and Andy Farrell says you keep going I'll pick you I don't know that all has to come out in the wash depending on how the World Cup goes because remember Joe Schmidt was going to be the Lions coach and he was going to stick around and still be the Ireland coach now after we won the last one <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. Uh, right, it's 7.59 this morning. David Scanlon says, I have new appreciation for Cameron now that I know he's a Leeds fan. Up to this point, though, he thought, yeah. you know, yeah, he was, he was out on you, but now he's okay. in. Okay, so maybe, it's, maybe I should reveal it more. Um, mm. Well, you've said it now, so you just haven't said your age. Miguel mm. says, I like this guy, Cameron. He speaks uncomfortable truths. Tell us if it's some uncomfortable truths about the Ireland players that are um, Irishmen abroad. Who, yes. Like Ben Heaney's now no longer an Irishman abroad. He's a Scotsman in Scotland. Scotsman, yeah. Um, but I was looking through some of the players that have kind of um, made their way abroad when they feel look my, I don't know if I'm going to get into this Ireland setup. so first one is Bolton Delan obviously um, Connacht Academy graduate 126 appearances for the province uh, from uh, Paris originally came over to Tralee when he was 7 uh, was a really big part of that triumphant 2015-16 Pro 12 season uh, earned his first international call up 
for Joe Schmidt's Six Nations squad in 2016 and has had 19 caps for Ireland. And I remember when he came through, there was big hype around him that it was going to be, ooh, those Delan Atoje duels are going to be fascinating over the next couple of years. There was talk of him maybe making the Lions squad in uh, 2017 for the tour in New Zealand. And he just hasn't been able to kind of capture that form that he showed in his breakthrough season. Um, and that's been due to injury and stiff competition for places in the Ireland squad. I mean, we've no shortage of second row options. Um, so he's gone over to La Rochelle, went over um, at the start of this season. He's under the tutelage of obviously Raj and Dunnock Ryan. And I think Dunnock Ryan especially will be hugely important um, in terms of him regaining some of his best form. Um, but he's made nine appearances for La Rochelle so far and has stiff competition in terms of mm-hmm. places on that team between Will Skelton and Thomas Laveau and Romain Sezi. So it'll, we'll have to see how he does, but I'm optimistic he'll be back to his best soon. Yeah, he's only 29, second row can go on to 36, 37. Like, I, Dunnick Ryan is one of the great what might have been in terms of an Ireland career. Anytime he played for Ireland, you're like, this guy's really, really, really good. And he looks like he's gone on to have a, already an excellent start to his coaching career. Um, you know, success from the off and a giant rugby brain. So very interested to see what impact he can have on Delan's career. Um, but anytime Delan played for Ireland, you're like, well, okay, I mean, this guy's good. Yeah. Like, so I don't know. I mean, you would... Um, he never put a foot wrong. It was just competition for places, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like, yeah. There was never a game where you looked at him going, nah, he's not... He's not good enough. No, and I think that that athleticism that he shows. I wonder what will happen, you know, so is it a two-year deal he's on with um, with Larry Stahl? I wonder what happened at the end of that if there's suddenly interest from the Irish provinces again going, okay, come on, come back in because like, you know, at 30, 31, you can have four years playing for Ireland. No problems in the second row. And like, um, certainly, we're, we're not festooned, I would argue, with, with options. I mean, like, is... John Klein better than Ulton Delan? He is not, I don't think. And it just that for whatever reason, that's what um, that's what Joe Schmidt wanted. Uh, there was a couple of others who were getting in ahead of ahead of him at the time. That um, in retrospect, like what what were Ireland doing? Not not giving Delan the game time. Then maybe he was injured and, and missed his opportunity. Quinn Rue, for example, like should Delan not have the Quinn Rue caps? Hmm. Yeah, I think he might. Yeah, he might feel slightly aggrieved there. Anyway, um, oh, who else? Uh, the Brennan brothers, so sons of former Leinster and Toulouse forward Trevor Brennan, who had 12 caps for Ireland, two European Cups with Toulouse, um, and lives in Toulouse now, owns the Danu pub, I think. I think he sold the Danu and moved he somewhere sold else. It. Yeah. Did he? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, he was there for ages and they have lived, that, like the brothers Daniel and Giacho have spent most of their lives in France, so Dan is playing at the moment for Brive, started his career with Toulouse, played with the French under 20s at the World Championship, um, joined Montpellier and then moved to Brief, so would have been in action against Connacht in the Challenge Cup not too long ago. Um, he, they're both Irish qualified. Uh, Dan has moved from tight head to loose head since joining Brief, and Joshua has captained French under his sides. He's made 15 appearances in the top 14 last season and 11 pe- appearances for Toulouse so far, including seven starts. They have great ball handling ability because of the kind of French flair that they're taught in that system. Um, but Joshua has that aggression and competitiveness that he obviously inherited from his dad. And what, what was in Joshua? He's second row. All oh, right. So, I don't know. I feel like Irish rugby doesn't have that kind of dog flair where there's a little bit of aggression and a little bit of niggle to them. Um, they're certainly not in the second row. I think from a marketing perspective, it would be great to get the two lads to play rugby oh, in Ireland. Yeah. I mean... Spit of their dad as well. Like, yeah. you know, getting, getting Trevor Brennan back in our lives would be good for all of us. <laughs> I just think that, like, uh, you know, whatever provinces out there should be like, can we not just... And, and just in case they're brilliant, like, because mm. there's a chance they might be. Pressure on the name as well, isn't there? Well, the thing is, right, maybe they actually want to play for France, having grown up in France and come up through the Toulouse system and you're like, oh, my dad played for Ireland, but I'm going to play for France. Yeah. Maybe that's what they want. So I, I definitely, we've had this conversation over the years at various stages and people are like, well, you know, you should actually just not assume that they want to play for us. It's like Ben Healy all over again. Let's not assume where they want to play. Yeah. But certainly, you, you can see how calls, surely calls have been made 
backdoor channels over a few a few quiet pints. Ah, uh, yeah, for sure. Look, we're, we're not we're not saying that they definitely get picked, but like, would they be interested? Yeah, I'd like to see them at a province. You see, we can't. We obviously can't pick players who aren't playing in Ireland, so therefore we'll never be able to get them. Mm. There's this kind of law of unintended consequences. We've made these rules. We've got to stick by them no matter what happens, especially if it means that we're going to lose loads of young talent. Ah, oh, there's a PR move there, as you say. <clears throat> it's a marketing thing. The Brennan brothers, the alliteration is perfect. Bring them back. Bring them back. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, five minutes past eight. Good stuff, Cameron. Thanks very much for that. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. During the ad break, you're going to hear a clip from the first club championship show of 2023. Hosts uh, Will O'Callaghan and Ashley O'Reilly spoke with Kilmacook Croke senior footballer Andrew McGowan about how well Shane Walsh has settled into the club. The club championship show on Off the Ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All Ireland Club Championships. Check out the hashtag The Toughest for more. Afterwards, we're going to speak with football analyst Jasmine Baba, who's analysed just why Evan Ferguson is such a promising striker at the top level of the game, plus why Frank Lampard is struggling tactically at Everton. Back after this. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports Rugby. Do I think England? are going to win the World Cup. They can, because they're still England. They can get it together. And they've got a lot of players to pick from. But I think it, it was unlikely with Eddie, and it's probably still unlikely with Steve Warthwick or anyone else. Subscribe to the Rugby Stream on the OTB Sports app now. The more you play with people, the more you get used to their position, you get used to their movements, and obviously you build chemistry. So to have them around, to have their knowledge and stuff as well, is, is huge. Did it take long to build the chemistry with Shane Walsh then? No, it didn't take long at all. <laughs> he's like he's a remarkable talent. I mean, people can debate all around his transfer and whatever else as much as they want. But even at this kind of, I would say, early stages of his Kilmacook Crokes career, he has come up trumps for you. I think back to even the kicking of points in the Leinster final. Um, like, just he was there to just keep the scoreboard ticking over throughout the game for you. Yeah, look, there, there was never any question about the talent that he'd bring to the team. He's a fantastic footballer, but as you're saying, how. how how long was it to build chemistry? Like, you know, he, he came in and um, started playing with us the moment that all of that kind of was settled. But the, the the big thing, credit I have to give him was the stuff that he does off the pitch. So, you know, like he's bought into our culture on the pitch. He's completely bought into our culture off the pitch. You know, he's come to us with uh, to hurling games, to senior two games, to the ladies football um, if there ever there's an event on or even a breakfast or a lunch, you know, he's there for it. So the fact that he, he joined he, our culture and, and kind of uh, slid his way in so, like, gracefully, it was, it's a huge credit to him. OTB AM With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Now we're joined by football analyst Jasmine Baba. Jasmine, good morning to you. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, all good. Um, looking forward to uh, Evan Ferguson bestriding Europe <laughs> like a colossus. We'll talk about Frank Lampard in a moment, but um, we're very excited uh, and we're being asked by some people who know about football to just keep a lid on the hype. But it's very difficult because we haven't had very good young players come through uh, the way Evan has come through. So we're asking you as a, an uh, impartial, honest bystander, um, What's the story? How good is he? I can see the reason why people are excited. Um, I obviously don't like to put young players under such pressure. Um, so keeping a lid on that, especially how we've seen young Premier League players turn out when they're they hit a few years after around the 22 stage, um, is a good idea. Um, however, I think the reason why you can be so excited about someone like Evan Ferguson is the type of striker he already is. When we, in scouting, when we look at younger players like this, especially in a forward role, they normally fit a profile. Every striker fits a profile. And when they're younger, they tend to have um, one or two capabilities that they fit. So, when we talk about target men or poachers, they're good at the box in, or they're good at running and they have one or two of these abilities. What I've seen from Evan Ferguson is that he's already well-rounded. So he doesn't fit in either of these boxes so far. And that's very rare for a young player and to fit into the Premier League straight away and have the dream start and debuts that he's had in the Premier League, the 
that is very exciting, um, especially with goals against Arsenal. Um, a goal against Arsenal, another goal against Everton and an assist. Although the goal against Everton was Everton being very, very bad on the day, it helps for confidence and consistency. And when you're 18 and you've just come in, you want to keep that consistency going, consistency in performance. Um, a goal won't come all the time, but if he keeps playing the way he's been playing and the coaching is how it is at Brighton. So I think they've done a fantastic job pitting, picking De Zerbe because it kind of fits the system that Brighton is known for. Um, it gives more more um, importance on a possessional based playing style, which it seems Evan Ferguson is used to and plays well in. And all of these things can help him grow into one of Ireland's best talents in, as you said, quite a while. Um, I, I, this is a tangent, obviously, but how impressed are you by De Zerbi and his ability to uh, step into at what, what looked like was going to be a difficult job because it looked like Brighton were slightly overachieving. There was a few weeks where he took time to get his feet under the table and since then they've been really, really excellent. Yes, I've not seen too, too much under De Zerbi, but especially recently, it seems that the kind of um, ripple effect of um, the change of manager has settled um, in especially coach recruitment. Um, we always give it around eight weeks or eight game days for the old manager's <laughs> tactics to leave and the new one to set in. So the fact that they had a little bit of a rough start and now we're getting better is a very clear sign of a good fit in philosophy for the club. Um, the fact that he's managed to pick a young, talented player from the second team, um, sorry, Premier League 2 team there under their youth team and add him to the senior team is also very exciting and a good, um, it shows good promise from what this coach can do and the kind of club organisation that he can use these kind of younger players um, successfully in his team. Yeah, and, and it speaks well about Brighton's ability to scout a coach who certainly wasn't one of the traditional carousel managers that gets linked with the vacant positions. Can you go back to that bit where you're talking about um, when you're you're profiling strikers, uh, they mm -hmm. fit into certain buckets. Just explain the different types of, of buckets and, and why it looks like Evan Ferguson is, is more well-rounded than just being one or the other. So um, to take a more traditional strike, uh, let's say, oh, I can't pick one from my head. Um, so we all know of a classic target man or someone who just hangs around the box, a poacher style, when they get called lazy because they don't track back so for instance uh who's a classic goal scorer who just hang, hung around the box all the time Olivia Giroud um, Van Nistelrooy yeah. comes to mind as well I, I would say Giroud did a little bit more but Giroud's more of the classic target man number nine tall could lay off passes for someone else and that's your classic kind of number nine role and then you've got someone a bit more like who would run in between um, the space of the pitch. So someone who collects the ball and runs into space, which a bit like Timo Werner, can't goal score clinically as much, but he's very good at picking up the ball and running into space. Um, and then we have deep line uh, strikers, a bit like Haaland, who will wait between the centre-backs to pick up the ball, can bully centre uh, defenders. Although... With Haaland, he's more of a complete striker. He fits more abilities because he's so good. Um, Lewandowski is another one who fits like all abilities. So target man, poacher, um, deep running, which runs into spaces and deep lying, which hangs around the centre backs. And Evan Ferguson, although not looking quite like Lewandowski or Haaland, he does more of what those strikers do more than Timo Werner does or the classic new number nines which are both winger strikers as I said collect the ball into space so Mbappe um, those kind of number nines and that's why you don't usually see that that young um, which is why Evan Ferguson looks really exciting for someone who's in scouting or recruitment. It's funny, Jasmine, because you, you don't often see strikers that, like you mentioned who are tall and pacey usually it's, it's, it's one or the other and also, 
you know, strong on both feet sounds like something that even a Sunday league striker should be. But the reality is, even the Premier League, not all strikers are good on both feet. And Evan Ferguson seems like the type of player, regardless of what foot the chance lands on, he's, he's, he's very strong. Yes, he's he's very balanced. And I think that's another thing, like physically balanced. He knows how to stay on his feet. He's like more physically progressed than let's say Timo Werner normally gets bullied off the ball quite easily, especially in space where um, Evan Ferguson's a bit more developed in that role. Um, I would say in terms of even comparisons, it's been really hard to nail down someone who looks like him. I, the closest I've got is maybe Diego, Diego Yota, but he is, again, more physically stronger than Diego Yota, so he looks more um, more developed. And, yeah, so he's strong on both feet, and he's also got a very good work rate, which... I don't know. You, you do see it in young players because they run around a lot. They give a lot. But his the way his work rate is used is very good. He presses really strongly, which is something you need a lot more now than you did five, ten years ago. Yeah, so we're right to be excited. Yeah, Not that we're getting carried definitely. away. <laughs> but it's one of those things that we, we kind of mould him and we put pressure on and, and the Robbie King comparison is often made. But... That's probably why, Jasmine, we get a little bit carried away because we, we don't get goal scorers in this country. Just just mm. strikers who can score goals, Robbie Keane notwithstanding. Niall Quinn was maybe one as well. But players who can put the ball in the onion bag on a regular basis don't come around too often. And I suppose two goals in, in two Premier League games is not a bad place to start at 18. <laughs> no, it, it, as I said, it's I can see why people are excited. It's In terms of general talents from Ireland as well, I think technically... I would say Josh Cowan's a really good like technical player and that I think is a, a wonderful player from the Irish national team. And as you said, goal scorers. I think there's just a general lack of goal scorers because we've heard this talk in Germany that no one's developing strikers. It's the fact that they're different kind of strikers as well. Everyone's fitting the more oh messy mould, the kind of running number nines, and we don't see any of those classic goal scorers anymore, or in a very um, a very reduced capacity. So for Ireland to have, bring out someone like this, I can see why people are excited, but he's only 18, there's a lot of years to go, you just have to hope that there's a good coaching system in place to really develop him and not break him before he gets to that early 20 stage where development is so important because that's a lot of years until his peak age, 25 to 29, peak performances, peak consistency of performances. So you need to keep developing until that kind of stage. Yeah. And look, he he, um, he comes from a, a football family. His, his dad was a, a footballer. And it's interesting, actually, all our best young footballers at the moment all have dads who were footballers at, at some level in the game. Um, Nathan Collins is the same. We have a kid at Celtic uh, whose dad was an um, Albanian international who played at Celtic as well. Um, so it's interesting that uh, the Nepo baby thing works in football, certainly, and in other industries too. Um, one last point about this then. If Evan Ferguson was English or German, there would be excitement about him as well, I suspect. And that's the point that it's not, it's not just us getting carried away because these types of players aren't coming along a lot at the moment. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I mean, they come around in different ways, don't they? It's, uh, I think England, we would not hear, we wouldn't stop hearing about them. I mean, look at the pressure that's being put on Jude Bellingham. Um, it's constant and he is the same age, 19 maybe. Um so I don't. I can see why everyone's excited. That is just the way it is. Um, I think there is loads of really good footballers that that are there. I think what people see as next generational talent has changed from what it has. Everyone's always looking for the next Messi, and not everyone is. Um, but they still can be completely good. They can. They can be completely talented. They can win a lot. They just need a team to function in. And sometimes that kind of side gets lost. And I think people forget about that quite a bit. 
Um, there's a, a nice little symmetry. Evan Ferguson's first game in senior football was against Frank Lampard in his first game as the Chelsea manager at a friendly in Dublin. We did think that perhaps his um, goal-scoring full debut in the Premier League against Frank Lampard might have been Frank Lampard's final game as the Everton, must, uh, Everton boss. However, it looks like he's going to be given the Manchester City, the Manchester United game in the Cup at the weekend to save his career um, I know you've been doing a bit of work on, on Lampard and, and why things have gone wrong for him at Everton. What What is your conclusion about him as a manager at this stage in his evolution? I, evolution's a strong word when it comes to Frank Lampard and tactics um, and just his general way of coaching. It's, it's so funny because he has telltale signs in the way he coaches or what he believes in, in his footballing principles that he carries from club to club. Um, And these have been around since his Derby managerial um, stint through Chelsea and now are being shown up again here. Um, So one of them is that they look unable to counter press, which is the process of, them his team defending straight after losing the ball and that whole process is not there I think a really good example of this is Pascal Gross's goal where they just give away the ball because it indicates a lack of structure while they have the ball and while they're trying to progress while they're trying to attack and um to just give away the ball in a really dangerous area and not make most of that ground back um is a really good example of why they look so terrible. Um, and this lack of structure is why they don't really go on to create any high quality chances during games. And um, yeah, that is, that's main principles of coaching of what you should bring to a club. And if that's looking at the same at every club, it looks like you are relying on the individual quality of your players to get out of these situations game by game, which is, you can't go on with that. That's not a a strong or stable way to coach your team. Um, And on top of this, it doesn't look like he has any um, recognized roles or processes for his players. So what his pivots are supposed to do each game, what his centre-backs, what his full-backs, they look like they have been left to their own decision-making, the players themselves. Um, Again, to grab an example from the Everton Brighton game, you can see the centre-backs are stuck in like decision crisis of how to cover Ferguson. They don't know whether they should track him and leave space behind, or do they stay put and let him run? Um, and we've seen it under Lampard's uh, Lampard systems countless of times. Players not know what they're doing, and him just moving players for the sake of it. So um, he's put Iwobi as a midfielder. He used to, at Chelsea, he played Kai Havertz as a winger, a nine, a, a ten, like all these different roles all the time and it honestly just doesn't look like he's progressed at all since Derby right that's go on no just take it like it, it's it's a confidence thing as well because we look at we look you look at the performance against Brighton and some of the players just look devoid of confidence I don't know how much blame you can place on a manager there maybe you place a lot of blame on a manager there because you, you see someone like Adrissa Gay and it's his second coming at Everton now and he just looks crap like the other the other day, it, it's just individual error after individual error. Well, isn't that the whole point? Sorry, just to interrupt you, right? Because I remember at the end of Lampard's career at Chelsea, he'd come out and go, oh, it's individual errors that are undoing us. But you're mm. you're making the point, Jasmine, that like if there's no strategy and all you're doing is asking the players to invent <laughs> everything, to make it up as they go along, well, that's where the individual errors come from. And there's no confidence yeah. because they've got no, am I doing a good job or a bad job? How do I know? Because I don't, yep. I'm, not, I'm not actually part of a plan. Yeah, but that is basically it. If you have no structure, if you have no roles, and we're talking like, I, is your pivot going to stay? If say you play two pivot, two play sixes, is one of them going to stay back and is one of them going ahead? I do not believe those pivot players have been told what their job is. I do not believe that under Lampard's system. I did not believe it, and it didn't look like that was the case under Derby or Chelsea. Um, 
under Derby, he had one of the best teams in the league and they just made the championship playoff final and they got beat by Aston Villa 2-1. And they didn't look like they had processes that day either. And it's the same throughout Chelsea. Um, Chelsea, they barely made top four, I think, because of everyone else failed. And they had so many good players that they just kind of fell into it. But after he left Chelsea, that team, that same exact team, won the Champions League. It is it is definitely that no confidence, not the individual areas, is be- genuine, genuinely because they have a lack, a lack of structure. And that comes down to coaching and what he's actually putting out on the pitch. And it's just not good. And we've seen it time after time that it's just not good. Um, questions coming in about uh, Manchester United. I, I don't want to put you on the spot by asking you about Ten Hag and, and his approach <laughs> to it, but you know, chalk and cheese. It seems like everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing, and you don't get in the team until you know what your role is. Even Casemiro didn't get straight in the team; he had to sit on the bench and watch and listen and be told. And like, I mean, that was. <laughs> it's obviously, in retrospect, it was handled incredibly well by Ten Hag, getting um, Casemiro into the team and and making sure that he was going to do the job that uh, Ten Hag wanted him to do. But um, that's the difference in a side where everybody knows what they're supposed to do, right? Yeah. And, um, I mean, you can see, like, the development of their tactics. The whole team went through this learning period of learning of what Ten Hag wanted to do, which is them learning elements of positional play. And um, they at the beginning, they made some easy mistakes Well. The principles and structural aspects were still visible but now they've become more stable as i mean they've won four games i have to say these are probably a good this is a good run of four games to have because they all come from the bottom five from wolves um nottingham forest so that has also helped so their game against city should show us how far they have actually come in what they've learned um, so they've, unlike what was happening before, they've now find multiple ways to progress the ball in this more possessional based philosophy that they have, um, it, whether it's through the middle of the pitch, through the rings or um, through and around being pressed. And they're looking better at transitioning the, from their build up play from the first third into the final third, which they had quite a few issues before. And as we said, like everyone knows their role. We know exactly how Ten Hag is playing. You can see the clear structure from Ajax. Um, and this is what it means when a coach has strong principles and a strong philosophy. Um, for a moment, I thought it wasn't going to work, especially with those easy mistakes. But um, now that they've had a good run of games, um, yeah, it's just to see how they do against Man City to see how much they've actually progressed. Seems like such an obvious thing, but Casemiro was a perfect example of how one player can can really change a team. And the Fred McTominay thing just just wasn't working in the end under Solskjaer and Mourinho. And Casemiro was just screaming out at United. They needed a player of that ilk. And Liverpool probably look at him, and and they could really do with a Casemiro at the moment as well. Um, when you look at that. Everton team and you see at United how one player and one signing can change things so drastically are Everton one or two signings away from from fixing things or is this more of a fundamental problem? Oh I think it's both I think I mean you could say one signing and that's the coach that was probably fixed quite a lot Um, and also I think they needed to do better with like finding a replacement with Richarlison I obviously know that they have Demar Gray and they have a um, and they have uh, Calvert Lewin who did amazingly a couple of seasons ago. But that again, devoid of confidence. But also, that did they even buy a replacement? I'm not sure. Um, I felt like they probably needed one because Rich, Rich Allison was such a big loss. Um, so that's obviously also needed. Um, I I I think most of their problems though are fundamental they have good players they have premier league players they should not be in a relegation fight um at all so for me that's more fundamental and coaching level rather than making one signing to change everything well that signing might happen after the weekend uh, if they get beaten by manchester united jasmine great to have you with us this morning that was brilliant thanks a million
Thank you. It's uh, Jasmine Baba, football analyst, giving us some thoughts on uh, an outsider's view on Evan Ferguson. We're right to be excited. Ah, uh, and, and I think that that's a fair point you made as well. Like if he was German or English, there would still be hype for sure. And and we often get carried away ourselves. But it'd be way more. It'd be worse actually. Uh, he could probably count his lucky stars that he's, he's Irish because the f- we, we while we're bad we, we're not that bad you know you'll give, you'll give players a chance but Jasmine said there he needs the coaching up until his you know yeah early to mid 20s that the that development phase so that's important yeah and that's why um, Brighton is a great place for him to be at the moment and like uh, there's every chance that he gets taken out of the first team for a period of time yeah. because not many 18 year olds come in and stick it out for the rest of the season mm. maybe maybe he can do that and maybe he can like be unusual in that um, but like that's not a massive setback either, you know. Like, yeah. We want him to be a Premier League striker in his early to mid twenties, which is three years away. And you he, know? he's still developing his personality. But the th- one thing I did pick up from Evans' personality from meeting him is that he, if he's if he was any more laid back, he'd be, he'd be lying down. Like he's just a chilled out individual. And I think that came across in his post match interview the other night as well against Everton. He's just fully confident in his own ability, and um, I don't think he, he listens to hype or even hears the hype. Doesn't care. So uh, that's a positive. So for 18 years of age, we uh, we have a right to be excited, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's the point of sport except to get us excited <laughs> and get us away from the mundanity of everyday life. Mm. It's uh, 8.31 this morning. We'd love to hear from you. 087-9180-180 is our WhatsApp number. You can get us at Off The Ball AM on Twitter or you can always get us uh, on our YouTube comments as well. Uh, now, uh, Ashing O'Reilly spoke with the new Monaghan manager Vinnie Corey last night after his first game in charge. A 2-10 to 12 point loss at home to Down to start their McKenna Cup defence. Take a look. We're back afterwards with the latest episode of Around the World with Hannon. Vinny, the first match under your belt in the in the McKenna Cup. How would you sum it up? Hey, listen, an awful lot of positives. Um, we were coming here today with probably, listen, you never know what to expect in the McKenna Cup because you go pretty experimental and you don't know what sort of team the other, the other crowd have and uh, you don't know how boys will adapt. But listen, I'd be you know, pleasantly surprised by how well some of our younger players did. Uh, so we'll take a lot of positives from that. We knew coming that Down had a lot of work done. Um, as most of the Division 2 and Division 3 teams have this time of year, they know they're really you know, they're really setting themselves for the start of the league because they, they know if they lose one league match, their, their promotion is in jeopardy. So uh, listen, we, knew, we knew it was going to be a tough test. So listen, I suppose we were playing uh, against a bit of a breeze in the first half. We were a goal down at half time, which we were happy enough with. Um, but we got, you know, we let in a bad goal at the start of the second half, which which put down to six, which meant when we had the breeze on our backs, we were constantly chasing it. Um, I, I thought Down probably cut us open a few times as well and could have had more. Um, but by, by and large, you know, most of the boys, most of the young players acquitted themselves quite well. It's another episode of Around the World, Jer, where we take a look at some of the quirky or different stories from the sporting world that we might have missed across the last week or two um, and they're always a little bit interesting and things that we mightn't otherwise get the chance to talk about so this week I wanted to start in um, the United States of America the Masters is coming up a few months but still um, one golfer who um, didn't get quite get his invite but then inv- inadvertently did get his invite is Scott Stallings so Scott St- Stallings for people who are unaware, there's a very formal process when you play the Masters. You get your invite set in the post. I saw Seamus Power, I think, over the Christmas period, sharing a nice uh, image on his social medias uh, with the uh, the invite in the post, uh, which is yeah. a lovely way to do it. Great way to start the year. It looks like um, you know they've spent time, money, coming up with this idea. It's all it's the Augusta Green. Yeah, the logos on it. It's a very formal, stiff, you know. Rigorous process that can't go wrong. White middle-aged male idea of, um, oh, this is going to look impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. It, you know, looks impressive. Gets the players excited. Uh, but turns out the, the process can go wrong. So Scott Stallings, for those of you unaware, 37-year-old, three-time PGA Tour winner. Uh, he posted the message on his uh, social media page the other day. He'd been waiting and he was pointing out the fact that he'd been checking his mailbox five times a day, not least because he's probably seeing other golfers getting their letter in the mail. I think he's only played once in the Masters, if, if I'm correct, uh, before, and that's way back in 2012. So obviously mm. this is the type of thing that, you know, it's a big, big deal. Yeah. He's obviously waiting for the post, whereas the likes of Tiger Woods and, and these guys are maybe not sitting beside the mailbox quite like uh, Scott Stallings is. Uh, but he posted a message from a namesake on his social media account. We, we have a few photos of these uh, images as well. Um, so, uh, hi Scott, my name is Scott Stallings as well. 
and I'm from Georgia. My he's, wife's name is Jennifer too. He slid into his DMs. He slid into his DMs, basically. We have a condo at, clearly that's redacted, and I received a FedEx today from the Masters inviting me to play in the Masters tournament April 6th, 9th, 2023. I'm 100% sure this is not for me. I play, but wow. Nowhere near your level. It's a very nice package, complete with everything needed to attend. I think we have some confusion because of our names, our wife's names, and geographical location. I can be reached at, redacted, and I'm more than happy to send this package to you. Which is fair enough, because clearly and there's another photo of... Uh, he DM'd him again with a couple of photos. I'm really not kidding, I promise. Uh, just in case Scott Stallings thought that the, there was no proof. That was the proof. There's the, the two lads side by side. Um, unsurprisingly, the guy on the right is the PGA Tour golfer, Scott Stallings. And the guy on the left is another Scott Stallings, who also has a wife called Jennifer, and also geographically fairly close by. Um, um, he's, play, he's played twice, 2012 and 2014. I don't know if you've seen uh, Phantom of the Open, that movie. Um, I haven't seen it yet, no. It's actually, it's, it's you know, it's a, a, a very nice, diverting uh, movie, but, um, you know, not a million miles away from this, where somebody decides that they're just going to try and play in the British Open, and they end up playing in the British Open, even though, like, oh, yes. plays off about 125. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's definitely worth digging out when if it's if it's on, make sure you watch it. But um, that's a recent film, recent yeah, day, twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how long do you think Scott Stallings sat there, the 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 doppelganger, and was like, "What if I just show up? I mean, I have the invite. You know, how many holes does he get in before everybody's like, hang on a second? There's no doubt he weighed this up in his head. How far, at least play the par three tournament the day before? But you see, Scott Stallings, the real one. Well, the real golfer, they're both real human beings. Um, would have eventually got on to to Augusta. And been he like, would, yeah. yeah. So what's the story? And like, oh, we've invited you. I'm like, no. And then, and then you just you, you just show up. You, you try and avoid, uh, you, you know, like you get there a bit early. Mm. Yeah, like, Wearing your golf gear. Yeah. Bring a caddy. A mate Practice a, caddy. a bit. Yeah. You know. But you see, I, I feel like going viral, and and this is the point. It has gone viral. So the tweets, uh, as of yesterday, have been viewed more than ten million times on Twitter. Many of the replies. Oh, he's gonna he's gonna be on the pip. Whatever that. What's the money thing that they get for you for being famous? Scott Stallings is all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he owes the other Scott Stallings a lot of money now. Hundred percent. I totally forgotten about that. Yeah, he's getting his fifteen minutes, and he's also increasing the name recognition. For yeah, the, what what's that money? What's that extra money they give you just for being famous? Oh, in the golf tournament, we wouldn't know, but I don't know. But like, like, I think Scott Stallings, the non-golfer, uh, probably thought, okay, I'm not going to get away with this, but. What will the real Scott Stallings give me? Would he like some people on, on social media are calling for him to invite him to be his guest at the Masters? Some people are going a step further and saying, "Let him be your caddy." Don't think that's going to happen. Well, let him be the caddy for the par three was what. what Sorry, well, let, fair enough. You know, uh, which obviously is like, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Which makes sense, but um, yeah, it, it's it's the realtor took the invitation. Uh, he's a realtor, this uh, non-golfer Scott Stallings. So the bit where he plays, he's like a, he's just a club hacker. Yeah, he's just a regular. Joe Soap okay. around the course but uh, he took it to a local shipping store mailed it to its rightful recipient somehow got the got the address or whatever uh, but like Scott Stallings the golfer he's not bad he's 54th in the world he's ranked uh, his last PGA Tour win did come in, in 2014 at the Farmers Insurance Open um, but yeah April 6th to April 9th we look forward to it with interest and all of a sudden Scott Stallings the PGA Tour golfer is someone we might follow because what a story it, it, you, you mentioned the movie from 2021 Scott Stallings goes on to win this Masters what a what a start to the movie! Yeah, yeah. The, 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 post. the player impact program is the pip where oh, yeah. um, they measure your social media impact that you've had across the year, and you get money at the end. It's basically they were, they invented it to give more money to the top players in the world who were pissed off about the fact that they don't get enough money, which is why Live exists in the first place because mm. there's room for somebody to break the monopoly that the PGA Tour have over the careers of the golfers and. Pip was a way for them to go, yeah, we, we accept that this relationship is uh, very uneven. You create all of the excitement and publicity and we make all the money, or certainly the vast majority of the money. And um, so maybe Scott Stallings is going to make a lot of money off this. 100%. Uh, it's like, you all know, of a sudden people are typing his name into Google oh, and search engines. And is this all, I mean, are we now so cynical that this whole thing is faked? Oh. There you go. Conspiracy right there from left field. Split the money. Maybe we'll try and get Scott Stallings on. They're, they're, Both of them. They're fake. Well, the fake or the real. We'll get both of them on. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm certainly, I, I hope Rory McIlroy wins the Masters and completes that major clean sweep. Of course, I'll be following the, uh, the other Irish players involved as well. But if they don't do it, Scott Stallings is my new favourite man to do it because the movie's going to be fantastic. I don't know who he looks like. Uh, I don't know who would play him in the movie necessarily. But um, yeah, of course, if he gets, well, there he is on the right-hand side. He kind of looks a little bit like 
Bradley Cooper maybe I don't know who plays the guy on the left Tom Hanks can pull off the grey hair he's done it in Sully so maybe it's Tom Hanks and Bradley Cooper we'll wait and see but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly I mean, Scott Stallings is like hey you said I look like Bradley Cooper <laughs> you, can, you can come and be my caddy at the Masters yeah 100% it doesn't look like Daniel Craig though but um, we'll move on from that one that was where I wanted to start off with because it's a little quirky story and uh, something a little bit different this week in the United States of America I want to go to the Spain next for our next around the world segment paying your own transfer fee there's Lucas Perez the man on screen so uh, he's reportedly paid some of his own fee to return to his b- beloved Deportivo La Coruña. So he's 37 years of age. He signed from the La-, La Liga side Cadiz. He's made just 31 appearances for them. Uh, it's now the fourth spell he's going to have had at Deportivo La Coruña. We all remember their Deportivo's games against Shelburne back in the day. They're not the team they used to be. They're in the third tier of Spanish football at the moment. Um, there was a valuation set for Perez of €500,000. Arsenal fans will be familiar with Lucas Perez because he was a bit of an Arsenal flop. Didn't quite work out for him there. He's a, he's a veteran striker, but he assigned for Deportivo on a one-and-a-half-year deal in a bid to help them rise back to La Liga. So this is a, a lovely romantic story where he comes back, when they're in the third tier, and they're like, we can't afford you. And he's like, don't worry about it. I'll pay some of my own transfer fee. Here's €250,000. Buy me. You pay the other half. I'll pay this half and uh, take me to the club they also posted a lovely touching video as well he joined the club and uh, the caption read today at 7 the boy returns home a lot of Deportivo fans crying in the in the comments as well he himself uh, tweeted as well to the Cadiz fans wishing them all the best um, is your cynical heart so broken that this is not a nice touching romantic story what, what's wrong with you no I'm sorry I'm probably being a touch sarcastic there but uh, ju- I mean anyone watching here would you, would you pay your own transfer fee for a club to, to sign oh, you unlikely but like Depending how rich you were, of course, it all, it, it's all relative. How, you know, I do wonder how much of a dent this is making in his personal fortune, but... Yeah. Uh, is this not, like, one of the rare uh, bits where someone proves that they actually do just love the game and love the club and, you know? This is one of the rare examples where you're being non-cynical and I'm... Compare and contrast with some of the other big transfer signings this week for, like, the richest footballer in the history of the world. Yeah. And uh, him, he newly fetching up in South Africa, he told everybody in his press conference. CR7. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a bit strange. I had offers and to go back to Portugal, but I said, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go and rescue Lisbon Sporting and, uh, you know, return to them... Ronaldo. The knowledge I stole from Doom but couldn't use. Well, Ronaldo's always gone on about this romantic um, idea of going back and helping out his, his home club. I love the idea of a footballer at the end of their career going out to help their, their their old club or, you know, some of the Irish players who started off in the League of Ireland. Like, I'd love to see Seamus Coleman come back and put in a couple of years with Sligo Rovers or, or even Finn Harps. Uh, it might not happen, but I like to see players do it when they still have a level of ability that can actually help the club. Because there's no point a washed up player coming back. But I mean, he, he's not he's not washed up just yet, Lucas Perez. He did play three seasons in England, as I said. Scored just seven goals for Arsenal, six for West Ham. So West Ham fans will be familiar with him as well. But he's a bit of a journeyman. He's played in Spain, England, Greece and Ukraine for a variety of clubs. But would you pay your own transfer fee? I mean, it's a question that Lucas Perez has forced us to ask this week. I mean, if Modern United had a team... And I'd you, you would pay to play? Yeah, if, if I had a certain amount of money and Monaghan did have financial difficulties, hence why they do not, lo, no longer exist as a League of Ireland entity. Um, I think I would. I think I would if I was a certain, of a certain wealth. Um, so that was a nice story, I thought, from, from Spain this week on Around the World. We'll move on next in Around the World this week to Santos, Brazil. Gianni Infantino, the guy everyone loves to hate at the moment, appeared on screen throughout the World Cup, usually about 60 seconds into every single match, sitting in his seat. Uh, FIFA asking every single country in the world to name a stadium after Pele. So, of course, Pele, very sadly, passing away on December 29th, aged 82, after his battle with, with colon cancer. And then Gian- Gianni Infantino, speaking in Santos uh, around Pele's wake, saying, uh, we are here to pay homage to him, and we are talking with all the federations to observe a m- moment of silence for Pele. But we are also asking and talking to every country in the world about having a football stadium named after Pele. In 50 or 100 years, when a child asks, who was Pele?, then we will be able to remember him. This would be fairly unprecedented. Um, I think a lot of people when they saw this news chair were like, I mean, Pele was fantastic and there's no doubt we want him to be, to be remembered and his legacy to continue uh, so young people of, of generations uh, future can, can look back and see videos and remember uh, the type of player that he was and how great he was. But I mean, naming a stadium in, in every country in the world after him 
seems a bit of a stretch. Rio de Janeiro, in fact, scrapped plans to name the Maracanã after Pelé. Uh, this was in, in April 2021. It was vetoed by the state governor. So they didn't, they didn't even do it for the most famous stadium in Brazil. Maybe now, well, uh, posthumously, they, they might consider it. Uh, I think the Maracana is is so is so amazing and important, and it's like such a. So I wouldn't I wouldn't change the name of the keep its name. Yeah, I mean, you could easily name a stand everywhere. Uh, I I I. This isn't the the shittest idea. <clears throat> that every Gianni, every country in the world. Yeah. The, the bar is low for the shit ideas that Gianni Infantino has inflicted or tried to inflict on world football. Um, but like, uh, with all due respect, right? Where are you from? Monaghan Town, County Monaghan. Uh, what's the name of the football pitch, the football stadium in clones? Soccer one. Um, yeah, well, I did, did what, play that quite it? recently. It's John Delaney, John Delaney Park. Right, well, you know, I mean, like, you, you see that people can do this. Yeah, but that's that's laughable that it's well, named John Delaney Park. Well, 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 but, well, they should rename it Pele Park. Yeah, but that's... Okay, so a football stadium... No, it's not a football stadium. It, it's a... It's a football facility with, with lots of nice pitches and Clonus Town play their matches there, but it's not... I, 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 I had in my head like the Pele Showgrounds over in Sligo or Pele Terryland Park or the Pele Turner's Cross or something to that effect. I think that's what Gianni Infantino wants. There's no point naming a tiny little pitch. I, I, I like the idea of taking John Delaney's name maybe off it and replacing it with Pele in Clonus. Makes sense. But uh, And if anyone in Clonus is watching, let's make that happen. But... um. No, I'm not having that. It has. It has to be. I feel like Gianni and Fantino wanted it to be big stadiums. Yeah, well, Surely, why not? you know the I, new Daily Mount. What are you going to call that? The, the, pe- new, the, the new Daily Mount. The Pelly Mount. Pelly Mount. Yeah, you could do anything with it. But I, I just think there's there's too much there I, to name a stadium in every country. Maybe every country can mark them in their own little ways. Both but could get get a new Pele jersey. Good. Well, that'd be a good seller. If anyone from Bose is watching, let's make that happen with OTB Sports a sponsor. Um... Yeah, I, I I don't know. Like we have a couple of photos from the wake itself, where Infantino was infamously pictured just out of shot there in the foreground is Pele's body in the open casket, um, and it just is a bit strange. There he is smiling, talking to Pele's crying widow. Um, just a little bit weird. Now I know photographs only capture a moment in time, and gr- yes, granted. Well, the selfies are kind of that's um, <laughs> it's a bit strange. <laughs> Does seem a little bit disrespectful. Yeah, a little bit like. Infantino said he was dismayed by the criticism. He said, I was asked by Pele's family and, and ex-teammates um, to take the photographs. Okay, fair enough. But I mean, just reply to say, I'll take the photo outside if you want. Yeah, I'm happy to have a photograph with you, just not with the body. Oh, Pele's body lying over there. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit strange. It's, it's now, at the same time, right? Dead people are dead. They, that's well, you can't. there is that they're, argument. They're not going to be... You know, it's more for the people not, that are alive that are left. Uh, yeah. I don't think Pele cares anymore, but... Um, it, the other story that kind of struck me from Santos from that Brazilian um, and, uh, element was that there's a lot of criticism for ex-Brazil players at not showing up for Pele's commemoration and funeral in Sao Paulo uh, Kaka a number of months back saying Brazilian Brazilians aren't good at commemorating and remembering great um, Kaka didn't show up for the funeral in Sao Paulo so he's getting a lot of hate and, and criticism I don't think any member of the 2002 World Cup squad from Brazil showed up to Pele's funeral I think maybe one member of the 94 team showed up. There was one of his teammates, I think, from 1970. Uh, a number of them, of course, are old um, at this point, but there was a serious lack of turnout. Look, you can read into that what you will, but um, it just it all looked, seemed a bit strange, and maybe they don't have the same culture around death as we do. Well, Ayrton Senna had three million at his funeral. Uh, it was far fewer at, at Pele's. I guess it's just because Pele had been ill for a long yeah. time. People were used to it, and Senna was such a, a shock. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the that's the, the Pele story. So that was Sao Paulo. We'll move on in around the world to Cleveland, USA. Donovan Mitchell, man familiar to a lot of Irish fans who watched the uh, the NBA. Uh, he had the best game of his career. There he is on screen, uh, and he said the best game of his career to overtime with an incredible play, a little too incredible, say the NBA. Um, so he had a, a bit of a desperation basket to force overtime. He intentionally missed a free throw to extend what did become his 71-point effort for the Cleveland Cavaliers. They had a 145-134 to win over the Chicago Bulls, and apparently it shouldn't have counted. So the NBA said afterwards he stepped over the plane of the free-throw line before the ball touched the basket ring, so he purposely missed the free-throw to catch the rebound, score the 
three pointer take the game to to overtime. Um, but players shooting a free throw cannot go over, of course, that foul until the ball reaches the basket cylinder. Violation. Chicago should have been given possession with four point seven seconds left, and the Bulls were leading at that point by two points, one hundred and thirty to one hundred and twenty eight. I mean, they all knew it was a violation. It was a bit strange. It kind of came out afterwards. It's almost similar to the, to the VAR checks that happen um, and the mistakes that the Premier League own up to and say, OK, we got that decision wrong. The NBA do something very similar. Um, he went on to score 13 points in overtime. So that's the, those 71 points are the most in the NBA since Kobe Bryant at 81 back in January 2006. So he broke Cleveland's single-game record of 57 that was held by LeBron James and Kyrie Irving. Took the game to over overtime, so an incredible achievement. But um, yeah, shouldn't have counted. So, in terms of asterisks being across records, that's certainly one. The final place I want to go to for around the world, a little bit of a bonus one for you, to Dubai. Waterford FC heading to Dubai for a pre-season camp. You don't see this too often in the League of Ireland, um, but they're heading to the sunny shores of Dubai for a pre-season tour in January. This was announced yesterday. Uh, looking for promotion for this upcoming season. Of course, they're still in the first division. Um, and a trip to the stunning sky ri- uh, skyline of United Arab Emirates. So the 22nd to the 20th of January, Waterford sit to play two games. One of them is against their sister club, Fleetwood Town. And we were talking about it before the show. The news of this partnership, John Walters coming on board as a technical director for both Waterford and Fleetwood, kind of came a couple of days before Christmas, snuck onto the radar a little bit. Um, but it's a fairly exciting uh, move. Scott Brown, of course, is the manager uh, now of Fleetwood Town. Joey Barton no longer in situ there. Uh, but it's just something that, that struck me as uh, something I wanted to mention this morning because you don't often see it. You get it in GA sometimes. You get the little All Ireland trip away. Yeah. Some of the, the warmer climb warm ups for the season potentially go under the radar. All the all the La Manga trips, it doesn't happen anymore, but it used to. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they're all about uh, Portugal these days, aren't they? Yeah, it's a little bit closer to home and, and perhaps uh, cheaper. But yeah, a, a League of Ireland First Division team taking a trip to, to Dubai. Maybe this is the sign of. The direction in which the League Rising of Ireland Rising tide lifting all League of Ireland boats. Exactly. Uh, right, that was your latest Around the World with Hannon. <laughs> a reminder that Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of Off the Ball. Start the new year with a delicious Braeburn oat milk coffee. January never tasted as good. It's available at Apple Green locations nationwide. At 8.52 this morning we're saying good morning to you, John Duggan. John. Jerry and Shane, where'd you get that music? Emma Carroll, I think, takes the credit it, it for that one. Kind of, I was visioning myself because I was just like, I wasn't even listening to what you're saying, Shane. Because I was Pat just thinking, thanks, John. I was just thinking, uh, thinking of myself in a kind of pink Cadillac zooming around Las Vegas with that music <laughs> on in the background. That's or Kentucky, yeah. That's this year's uh, 2023 version of the Kentucky trip, is it? Possibly, Vegas. yeah. Yeah, we'll see how we get on. We should all go over for the for the Formula One, Las Vegas Formula One. Amazing. Huh? Do are, a, you, are you um, fanboying David Coulthard when he's in town next weekend? Is he in town? This <laughs> is the reaction. Yeah. I, hadn't heard that. I hadn't heard that at all. <laughs> no, the Red Bull car is going to be up and down the... Um... In Dublin? Yeah. Ah, I'm going to that. Do you, you always just don't read emails, is it? Jesus. That, that, that had skipped me by. Maybe maybe I hadn't seen that email. I yeah. clearly hadn't seen you that. You had email. your Christmas morning twice. Credit station closes oh. tomorrow, so you better, uh, you better... Or maybe today. I'll have a look. I'll have a look. Jesus, that'll be class. Good that we're having these production meetings on air, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do yes. that. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Yesterday's Tottenham discussion is not today's Tottenham discussion. Well, I was going to say we were we were writing them <laughs> off. Yeah, for a matter they, they were done. It'd be next week. Will be last week's conversation. So mm. it's just the way it goes, isn't it? I saw a bit of the first half. Yeah. and um, was, was like enough dreadful. of this. Enough of this for me. Um, I saw Matt Hardy making a good run, but then just a bad cross over somebody's head. But obviously, in the second half, he was on fire. Well, it was Kane. Kane was just world class as he can be, and um, Spurs have the fifth Beatle in their team as well, Brian Heal who is a very promising, technically gifted young lad, but not very physically strong. So if he can get a bit stronger, he could be somebody that can uh, do something in the Premier League with Tottenham. Um, look, Palace have been had a bit of a strange run. Um, they were thumped by Fulham. I know they had a couple of sendings off, but they haven't been in the best of Nick, and uh, Spurs did up the tempo in the second half. And what is it? Maybe a confidence thing? Like Conte, I don't believe, said anything to them at halftime, and maybe they felt a bit guilty and... Uh, decided, you know what, we're going to play for a bit of pride here. And that's what they did. And Harry Kane is now 264 goals, two off Jimmy Greaves' record, uh, 198 goals in 300 Premier League games for Harry Kane. Um, now, his ratio is uh, inferior to Greaves. So I would always put Greaves ahead of him. Um, but Kane will break that record very, very soon. Um, always put him ahead of him. What does Harry Kane need to do to I don't know, no. win a trophy? Win a, win a trophy. Nobody will ever be Greaves <clears> in my mind. Is this nostalgia bias? Not at all. I don't. I don't think so. I think Greaves is one of the like. Look at forty-four goals in fifty-seven England internationals. Mm. Uh, 
was one of the very first players to leave England to go to Italy. Um, you know, the first English uh, English club to win a European trophy, the Cup Winners' Cup, uh, won the FA Cup when it was a really prestigious competition a couple of times. So, um, just because he didn't play in the 1966 World Cup doesn't uh, take away it on the, from what Jimmy Greaves achieved. So, but Harry Kane, yeah, he's, uh, he's he was he was excellent last night. But um, <coughs> what would they do without him? I was hearing some Harry Kane to Manchester United rumours yesterday. Don't think it'll happen for a number number of reasons, um, particularly because the Glazers are. Selling the club and apparently only want loan deals for, for number nines at the minute. Well, Bayern Munich are the club that have been consistently linked with Kane um, and would have probably have the money and the will. And I do think that it could be the case in the summer. There's still a lot of chance last night against Daniel Levy. So, um, look, Conte staying today, next week, who knows, they'll lose again. They're playing Arsenal, I think, Saturday week. The constant referendum week, is, rather. is a bit wearing, right? It is wearing, yeah. It is wearing. Lucky. So, shit or get off the pop. Antonio. You know, it's even, we were speaking about it 24 hours ago. I uh, thought the Villa Wolves game was good. Uh, interesting to have two Europa League managers in the sideline winning managers mm. uh, in uh, Emery and Lapetegui. A uh, great goal by Pedence. But um, it's interesting, Liam Bailey started crying after uh, missing that chance at the end. And then what? Uh, Southampton are going down. Um, look, they're, they're just terrible. And uh, Forrest got a win. And then it was a two all draw, wasn't it? Leeds and uh, West Ham. So we got Chelsea and Man City tonight. It's uh, a worrying time if you're a Chelsea fan because it doesn't seem to be much of an identity around Graham Potter's team yet. And uh, are the owners too um, prone to interference and to be kind of getting involved in the fancy manager situation with transfers and that kind of thing? You'd wonder where Chelsea's project's going over the next 18 months, you know? Mm. Um, the Lopetegui thing is going to be interesting, right? Yes. Yeah. He's a very, very good manager who was in the elite of the game and is now managing Wolves. And yeah. so uh, if he can keep them up and have a couple of seasons there, I think that he could easily become one of those elite managers on that carousel again. Um, who's going down? So you said Southampton. Southampton and Bournemouth are going down. I'd agree with you. I think Wolves are actually, even in the first few games I've seen them under Lapetegui, they're better. On that, on Southampton, you say they're definitely going down. Gavin Vizunu, if he does get relegated to the, cha- to the Championship, which looks quite likely, like... Does he need to move to the Premier League? No, it's fine. Gavin Mazzini just, think, Gav, Gav just needs experience. He just like like goalkeepers playing until they're forty. But he's proved that he can be a Premier League goalkeeper. Yeah. But stay with them because they'll come back up. There's the, the parachute payments. They've got a, an excellent scouting system. Very tough division to get out of though. Yeah, but they'll they'll be the best team in the by a mile. Like they're a, they're a Premier League uh, scouting. Now they don't have a lot of Premier League quality. Who you would say are the high end quality, but they've loads of good players. Mm. Don't know if they should have sacked Hatton Hootle so swiftly. Yeah, I, I would have kept Hatton Hootle. Um, no, I think if you're Brazuno in your early twenties, you just want to be getting experience. I think yeah. experience is game the key. time. Game time is everything. Unlike what Quiven Gallagher is getting. Well, that's it, as we said yesterday as well. Um, so look, uh, I just think so. Who's the third team? You're saying you're saying Bournemouth are going down? <sighs> yeah, Bournemouth are a Championship club um, that had a nice run and a bit of a sugar high under Gary O'Neill. Uh, but they're going down. I actually think, looking at it, I do think Wolves are going to survive. And I think Forest have got a really good manager as well. And I think they've de- defensively really improved in the last few games. I think Everton are real trouble. I, I, they all say too big to fail. Everton, it's a conti- continuous problem with Everton. And if, if, if you knew who the next manager was, is there a possibility that that would change? So say Sean Dyche comes in, does that change your view? Or Wayne Rooney? <laughs> um... You'd want to see some striker. Like, see, why do they sign a Mope? I, I don't really get, you know, Calvert Lewin, too injury prone. Oh, he's a shadow of himself. I, I don't, I, I don't even think. I think Dyche would be great to bring Everton back up, but I, I like, really do feel when I'm looking around Forest and Wolves and West Ham and Leeds and all these clubs. I, I'm, I'm questioning whether Everton can survive actually. Okay. Or what are they going to do with Lampard? Are they going to they're going to sack him twist? At, they're going to sack him at the weekend. You think so? Yeah. Tomorrow night is the United game at Old Trafford. Yeah. yeah so. I didn't I didn't realize, but their financial fair play situation is so desperate that they seem to have to get rid of somebody in this window. Mm. Now, who's uh, that going to be? I don't know. They're talking about getting some of the high earners off the books, but like, do you just cash in on your one good asset and maybe they'll try and sell Pickford? I don't know. Um, or where would he go? I was thinking more Gordon, but yeah, Gordon. Yeah. Um, so look, I don't. Yeah. Well, Chelsea probably sign him. Um, so we obviously had the O'Byrne Cup and the McGrath Cup and the Dr. McKenna Cup all last night. And only three of the Kerry players that started that All-Ireland were in that Kerry team that lost fought over 5-11 to 14 points to Cork. Um, we're doing a panel on Saturday, half one, on 
this uh, off the ball show and you talk on the weekend, just predicting the sporting year. Always a good thing. I know you did your crystal ball, Jar, with the with the lads. So um, I think the the banker of the year for me is Leona Maguire to win a major. She's got five chances, and I think she's the real deal. I think the surprise of the year for me would be that Limerick will not win the All Ireland. Oh, jeez, in the off. hurling uh, because I think like, a bit like Messi, they've completed hurling. They've done everything they've needed to do. They've won three in a row. They've beaten every team along the way. They've become this amazing brand. They've won four All-Irelands in, what, five attempts. And only twice in the history of Hurling has four in a row been completed. Galway weren't too far away from them last year. And I know Limerick are the, uh, the top dogs, but I always feel that Cork are, are, are a team that... I think Pat Ryan's a very good manager, and um, I do think Cork, with their underage success, are a team that's coming. It might not be this year, but they are coming. And sometimes in history, Cork have come out of nowhere, and maybe that could be the year uh, 2023 when that happens. You're saying Limerick are like JF and the in-betweeners? Completed it, mate. I, when have you completed hurling? <clears throat> you got to keep winning. Dude. Like these Limerick players are in their prime still. A lot, of, a lot of them. I think if you, the 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 next thing to say if Limerick have completed anything is to win five in a row because it's never been done in the history of the game. Mm. That's the net. That's the only thing that because everything else has been achieved. Yeah, I think I think they're they're interested in history. I think um, that's the type of thing that they're gonna want to do. Yeah. Um, never saw the in betweeners. You've never seen the in betweeners. No. Nor a peep show. Oh, John, you're missing out there. In betweeners is fantastic. Peep show's great as well, but yeah, you'd like you'd like peep show, right? Um, Get some culture into you. But uh, to be honest, I've been watching the um, the mess that is the Republicans. I don't know if you're watching that in America. It's 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 absolute box office television. Kevin McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy stuff. It's just I don't think you even need to be into politics to watch the the, the, the insanity. Just the, the Twitter memes and all the, the funny stuff. It's um, it is like a soap opera. It's been good fun. Yeah, it's been good fun. <laughs> Um, to see that but um, that's a tangent but uh, yeah um, FA Cup the tragic of the Cup this weekend and uh, still wouldn't mind seeing Spurs win it though in, in May you know to win a trophy but um, yeah that's what's the hope that kills you John that's what's happening that's what's happening going forward well it's it, do you prefer would you prefer the, the O'Byrne Cup or the FA Cup <laughs> uh, well there's only one cup that matters and that's the Sam Maguire Cup and um just Dublin are just absolutely fascinating this this season. Like the the whole Gilroy thing, the Mannion McCaffrey thing. It's it's almost like the we're getting the band back together for one last go. Who do you have in your predictions? Uh, not to give away anything for Saturday, of course, but um, the football. Uh, Dublin. Mm. And um, there's no cute heroism there. It's just straight in with it. I I do think Rory will win a major. Um, I really hope it's the Masters, but um, I think he's got. I think he's got his. I don't know whether Tiger Woods helped him or not with wedges, but. It was definitely some kind of conversation that Rory had with Woods, and um, I just do feel that. Like, imagine him going ten years without. A, imagine he doesn't win a major this year, and it'll be ten years down without a major. Uh, I heard Joe talking about it. He he rang him up and told him that there was something wrong with his his wedge game and that he could fix it for him. Yeah. Um, was it a Saturday? It was the Sunday pay per view that, that Fionn Davenport was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was talking about that, yeah. and. Um, yeah, but he did fix it. My immediate conclusion was the same as Fionn's. It was like, well, obviously Tiger's finished. That's it. That's his retirement. Hey, buddy, yeah, you're yeah. my you're my guy. Yeah, you're my number one guy. He's been and, anointed, um, hasn't he? Really? Yeah, Tiger. yeah. And he's he stepped into it and he deserves it. Like yeah. he's he's made a massive comeback from where I'd say this time last year we were saying is, is Rory still relevant? Uh, maybe it was maybe it was just before that. Cause I think he finished the previous year well, but certainly it didn't feel like he was going to be relevant in the majors again because it looked like he had more interest in other things. And then it seems like Liv came along at just the right moment to galvanise his sense of the game and that maturity that comes with being a leader and really enjoying that role and being ready for it has been a transformative moment in his career on the on the uh, golf course. But, but, he, sorry, John. Here's one for you. I love Rory as well, and I hope he does win the Masters. I think Charlie Woods will win the Masters before ah, Rory McIlroy. Come on, Shane, come on. Charlie's 13 get, years of age. Get out age. of that garden, will you? He's um, showing a lot of promise, walking get around those courses garden. with his dad. <laughs> 13 years of age, so he could win a Masters at what? Realistically, 20? <laughs> Another seven years? What, what, that'll be 2030? Charlie Woods could win a Masters in 2030. Well, uh, you know, Rory's gone 10 years nearly let's, without a major. Let's, let's wait for Charlie Woods to... Well, he could. Uh, stick a tenor on that there. Get through, yeah. get through his adolescence, become a, an adult and actually become a I professional. Ho I hope doctor. I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Chris Kirkland's dad, when he was born, had yeah. a bet for him to play for England and he didn't ever, never made it, did he? Or did he, did he cash in? Iker Casillas' dad did it as well, well, I think. There was somebody who was like in squads but never actually... Mm. Um, 
Somebody did that with Mark Williams. I think they put money on Mark Williams to win the world title. There you and, go. And they won a lot of money. See, like um, I remember the, the 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 biggest one was Maggie Simpson to be Mr. Burns. And oh, to, the shooter. To, yeah, because it was shown in America before here, oh, and yeah. a bookmaker offered five hundred to one, and I think there was some money uh, laid on it. But um, were you on that? Me? No. no Most no, unrealistic no, of shooters. No. Um, uh, Charlie, yeah, Charlie Woods. No, I think I, that's I do a, have a legend, but it's not that that big. Um, no, 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 Charlie. Not Woods. having it. Not a, not having a chain. We'll do a Saturday panel in twenty thirty, and we'll we'll revisit. Well, when Charlie we're... when Charlie's lifting up, or where, but getting that green jacket let's, put onto him at twenty get, years of age. Three, by his dad, will they get his dad to do it? Three, oh, break with tradition. Let's get Here, dry, dry January first, please. That'll make the the what is it? The log cabin or the the creepy cabin after the. The butler's cabin. The butler's cabin. The butler's cabin. Yeah. The creepy butler's cabin. Yeah. Um, bring bring Tiger in to give Charlie. Why is it creepy? Well, it's it's a little bit creepy. Just Jim Nance is a bit creepy. That's the, I think the whole thing about the whole aura in there is creepy. It's like it's very nineteen fifties. They look like wooden robots <laughs> sitting in those seats. They do look weird. There is actually, I'm always in bed by the time that happens. Though I'm like enough. There there is a place at Augusta called Berkman's Place, which is apparently the VIP um, area. Mm. So EV, Augusta itself is VIP, and then within Augusta there's a VIP area, which you're not allowed to bring your phone into or take any photos. And it's almost like this mystery place. I was reading about it. It's an interesting uh, place to, to, to check up on Berkman's place. Um, that's where all the Coca-Colas and the other corporates go to. But um, no, I think there's... Um, well, you've done the Breeders' Cup, John. You've got to do... Ma- you gotta well, do look, you know, uh, there's a computer game called Grand Theft Auto, which you had cheats in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas where you go to the Greyhound shop um, you back Greyhounds whatever and you just won unlimited amount of money and you go around them with an unlimited amount of money I think that's what I'd need to have to uh, be able to go to Augusta I think they're talk- I think it generally costs about 15 grand to go to Augusta I'd say if yeah. you want to be doing it properly It's all about who you know if there's yeah. anyone watching or listening uh, you know it's uh, you're looking for if you're looking at, at second uh, hand second well, secondary market tickets it's about 10,000 for the week, I think, or a couple of days to go right. to Augusta. It's uh, pretty steep. Yeah, so, you know, you're better off spending it on uh, whatever, trying to save for a house in this country or something like that. Yeah. JD, All right, lads. Thanks. thanks a million. Uh, right, if you want to get in touch this morning, 087-9180-180 is the WhatsApp number, or you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. O'Toole1905 says, Lads, I'm a Southampton fan. I've seen most of the games this season, and I think Bazuno has been poor and miles off a Premier League standard keeper. Um, I think, you know, probably just being a bit harsh there. Like, mm. Uh, the team is disorganised. The uh, defence isn't particularly good. Bazzino's an excellent keeper and he's definitely going to make it. Yeah. Um, and he's clearly our number one heading into the France game. Yeah, I, so. I also do think though that like a season in the Championship at this stage of his career isn't the worst thing for him. I, I think Southampton are going to be winning Thank games you. in the... Um, oh, the mic's still on there, folks. Um, I think um, that being in a team that is confident, mm. you know, it'll be a new manager more than likely, yeah. I think, who... Um, if if they do get down, if they do get relegated, Nathan Jones though. is getting a per reception from the Southampton fans last night, so that can't last much longer, really. No. Um, Paul Kirk is asking: Would the likes of Gerrard and Lampard, etc., be better coaches than managers? Everyone seems to be assessed with becoming managers, which is a hugely different role to coaching. That's an ego thing. They couldn't be coaches. I don't think that they want to be um, front and center. Like their teams don't display evidence of a. a f- a footballing and coaching philosophy mm. and so if as the manager you can't get that into your team what would suggest that you could do that as a coach yeah. now from their career perspective it'd be a really good idea for them to go off and become coaches for a while yeah do that first and to, to learn to get that into um, sorry John Walters doing he's doing well, he's doing the ranks underage with Tom Mohan in the Irish underage setup. now he's technical director at Fleetwood and Waterford two under the radar jobs as such perfect way to go about it don't go straight into the top the top game. Right, eight minutes past nine. Time for the first deal or no deal of 2023. Very right, Maddie Taylor. I can see him getting his car. I've decided to go to Bolton. I'm waving him going out the car. Man. Just love moving teams, and then you have to do an initiation. They just don't seem to be able to get deals over the line. Right, Phil Egan, welcome back, buddy. How are you doing, lads? Deal or no deal, 2023 version. Are you excited for this month? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going around, obviously, and it's you know, people would have put themselves in the shop window with the World Cup, so that adds a few a few pounds or a few euros to the the, the value. I think one of those examples would be Enzo Fernandez. Yeah, 
which hasn't quite been the done deal that we thought it was no. going to be when we were talking about it the other day because it looked like there was an impetus behind it that it was getting over the line that Chelsea were going to pay more than the buyout clause. Now Chelsea are like, hang on, maybe we shouldn't pay more if there's like a... Well, the figure's nowhere near now. If what they were a fixed fee, quotes. we should pay the fixed fee at, at most. Yeah. yeah. So what's going on here? I, I See, I think there's always so much speculation about this, right? That there's just... It's very easy just to get stories out there and it gets people excited because people get so excited about the, th- the prospects of their club signing players. Mm. You know, it's almost they forget where their, their team is. They just think, let's, get tr- like, let's win the transfer window. Whereas the best thing you can be doing is getting these deals done without anyone really knowing. I mean, Cody Hakpo all of a sudden arrives at Liverpool. Like, that that's, was, just, that, that's a rare thing in the modern day. That but n- Liverpool have knows. actually been quite good at it, yet they are linked with everyone at the moment. Yeah. Whereas you kind of think that's not going to happen. But what it does is it gets Liverpool fans excited about... Gee, like At one stage, they were linked with about four midfielders, but they mightn't even sign a midfielder in January. What I'm saying is that, you know, it's kind of like soap gossip where, you know, it, it gives you a little insight into what clubs might be thinking, but you can't believe it all. Yeah, uh, when it comes to transfers, you can literally make anything up and... Uh, it's largely now believable because so many ridiculous things have happened in terms of prices for players yeah. who really weren't worth it. Um, the, the, it's, it's interesting though, the, the, the difference if you think about um, how Liverpool have gone about their business versus say Manchester United who've been involved in sagas that are yeah. all season long. The Sancho thing was a saga and they didn't really learn from that. Um, you would hope that the new manager has somehow got more of a handle on the relationship with the rest of the club and wherever the leaks were coming from Uh, and because there seems to be more of a strategy behind what they're trying to do on the pitch perhaps that will feed into their transfer strategy I'm not sure because they they had obviously been um, linked with are you saying Hackpo are we going with the soft G Hackpo I think both are okay right because the Togolese would pronounce it with a G and that's um, where it originates from as well. So, okay. I mean, the Dutch would never pronounce the G as a hard G. Louis. Hakpo. Louis van Gaal. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know. What do you expect from Manchester United in this window? I think they have to sign a striker because if something happens, Rashford, I, I expect something to happen in Martial mm. because he's just very injury prone. But if something happens to Rashford, they need backup. And they're, they're going to need to take him out anyway because he's an explosive player. And he's in great form, and you know he's one of the the many players that have returned to form under Eric Ten Hag, and even just the the disciplinary issue against Wolves, where yeah, you know you you slept in, it, it can happen, but you got to pay the consequences. You're on the bench, comes on at half time and scores, and it just seems everything Ten Hag is doing at the moment is going very well. Um, you know, obviously the the Ronaldo business, so he's shown like he has the power, and players will. There is players in this United squad who have down tools and thrown previous managers under the bus, but right now they know they're not in a position to do that because he's the boss and it, you know everyone's behind him. Yeah, mm. as somebody on Twitter and I apologise for missing it said, the banter era at Manchester United appears to be over. It was we, it was a great run while we ten had years, it. yeah, yeah well, a long time, a good decade. Yeah, but it's <clears throat> you know it. It can creep back in very quickly as well. It just takes a few bad results that then players start getting frustrated again. It's very, when things are going well and there's going to be a spell, which obviously happened at the start of the season, you think back to the, the Brighton and Brentford defeats and they've steadied the ship so, so well after that. But if there's a few sticky results, then it's how they react to that. But right now they look like they're just very, very solid. They're very efficient. Um, I wouldn't say they're as easy in the eye as they will be when he gets exactly what he wants from the players that he gets to bring in, but also the players that he has get to understand exactly what he's looking for. There's just a bit of organisation about United now. All of a sudden, the, the, the Casemiro goal the other night against Bournemouth, set piece, and United couldn't score from set pieces at all. They have a set piece guy now. Yeah. They have Steve McLaren in, who's probably doing an underrated job as well, of course, Ten Hag's Dutch kind of colleague. Um, I mean, Aaron speaks good Dutch. Very good Dutch. Fluent, yeah. Very fluent in Dutch. <clears throat> but like, that sort of thing goes on goes unnoticed. Like Casemiro comes in, as you say, the decision making not to play him straight away mm. has clearly come back to um, come and, to fruition. And let's not forget when they brought in Casemiro, a lot of people thought 
is this just not what United have been doing for the last 10 years where they're signing players that are, are I'm not, say, not, not saying that Casemiro was passive, but you would suggest his best days were gone. But the thing is, Casemiro, even not at his best, is still far better than anything United have had in there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a cultural reset and it seems to be working so far. As you say, though, um, you know, uh, let's not get too carried away yet. The, the season is long. The one thing that I'm surprised by is that they seem to be lobbying hard to keep David De Gea and sign him to a long-term deal. I wasn't sure. I don't think. I mean, he played well from the chances I saw. Been very well recently, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, he's saving lots, but is he is he going to be the goalkeeper who lets that team play exactly the way they want to play in two years' time? I'm not sure. Maybe maybe it's not a two years' time decision. Maybe he's kicking that can down the road and saying we have much more. Well, he's free to talk to new clubs problems. as of New Year's Day. But yeah, but it's also very hard to recruit a new keeper and say, right, there you go, you're mm. in. De Gea is gone. Um, you're now the number one in Manchester United. This is how we want to play, and it's just not that easy. No, Jack Button was the rumor yesterday. Yeah, as that's a backup. That's a backup because Dubravka has gone back. Yeah, like Dubravka came in and played a few games, did okay. Yeah, but it, it's just there. It, it's hard to get a good backup keeper, where you know that your first choice keeper is out, and you think, Do you know what, you know, it's not going to be too much of a, an issue. Just when you mentioned, sorry, the number nine situation at United, <clears throat> the banter era that you mentioned, like you had Falcao, Alexis Sanchez, Audi Nogalo, all these guys coming in who are washed up strikers they have to sign <clears throat> someone properly but you're seeing names being linked like Alvaro Morata Olivier Giroud and again maybe they just need to sign someone on loan until the summer but I, I, like, what, what name strikes you as the, the player that's the answer there? There was a few people suggesting a good signing for them would be Memphis Depay mm. and I know since he left United things have changed you know he, you know, he had a good <clears throat> time at Leon, um, but I, I'm not sure about that one uh, Chupa Moting's name has come up. And again, he's been in really good form for Bayern Munich. People that If people don't watch football outside the Premier League, or they're not going to know that. They're going to just think this guy wasn't very good at Stoke. Yeah. But you know, people said that about Mo Salah when he arrived back at Liverpool going, oh, is this the Chelsea reject? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, same with De Bruyne. Um, very quickly, right. Uh, do you expect the big transfers to happen or are these just sagas for the window to keep the fans I think, interested? I think some of them will happen um, because clubs are desperate. Obviously, the, the Mudrick one for Arsenal. One thing that struck me watching Arsenal the other night, the first 11, very good. Didn't have many options no. on the bench. Obviously, Gabriel Jesus is injured. Figueroa was on the bench. Who one sub to the very, night, A very good player. Yeah, the Tommy Atsu came on. So, I think... So much can depend. You need a bit of luck in terms of injuries. And that I include United in that. I Obviously, you look at... I, Manchester City are the best equipped that even if something happened Erling Haaland, they have Alvarez. Yeah. yeah. They'd be fine. They'll be fine. But you just think that a lot of the managers are going to be looking going, I need some backup here because, you know, we are, after coming off the back of a World Cup, the second half of the season is longer than normal. <coughs> so... Let's uh, make sure we get back up and we're not caught short. All right, feel good stuff. That is the first episode of uh, 2023's Deal or No Deal. I write Maddie Taylor. I can see him getting his car. <laughs> I've decided to go to Bolton. I'm waving him going out the car park. Just love moving teams and then you have to do an initiation. They just don't seem to be able to get deals over the line. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you today. Uh, Jerry Eisenberg and Ali is OTB Gold at one o'clock. A leader's questions with Richard Lancaster at three. GA Democracy is our retro panel at four. And Declan Murphy, his book Centaur, is uh, the story at six o'clock. And then the show is live tonight with Nathan from seven. You can follow off the ball across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in the latest sports content. Up next, Italian 90 legend and Ireland heartbreaker Toto Schilacci is going to join us in studio as he prepares to launch Chasing the Ball, the World Cup sticker collection in Dublin later on today. First, Kenny Cunningham was in studio last night to reflect on Evan Ferguson's stunning form. Enjoy this. He is the youngest player to score in consecutive top flight games for a club since Federico Makeda from Manchester United in 09. So that's a cautionary tale. Let's not get carried away. Uh, But still, this is absolutely phenomenal. 
Yeah, I think it is. I think we've all probably seen enough of uh, Evan play underage football at uh, Ireland under 21s in particular. He's made it an impression of late. So I think we're all aware of the attributes which he has, his physical uh, size in uh, particular, athleticism, like technical ability for somebody that big, really nice uh, uh, technique on the ball. And I think for me, from the outside looking in, which impressed me, and obviously I don't know a huge amount about uh, Evan and obviously his development, but when he initially went to Brighton and he went there, was he was he 15 when he was 16? It's more 16. 16, yeah, wasn't 16, it? Yeah, yeah exactly. 16, yeah. But very quickly, he made big strides very quickly. It didn't seem within a year almost, he was in the other 23s, uh, Rich, and he was playing mm. regularly there at that, at that level. And that's a massive, that's a big jump. You know, you're playing there with some outstanding youth players and even uh, professionals at the under 23 you're allowed so many overage players and then it seemed very quickly after that he was on the fringes of the of the first team he was including a couple of squads he was on the bench I mean that's that's huge you know that those to make those strides that quickly was a little indication that not in terms of the ability which he has that, I, that I've spoken about but just kind of mentally as well in between his ears in terms of his kind of uh, maturity and stuff that he was it was literally all there. It was just a case of being patient and just waiting for it to come to the come to the fore. So, I, uh, and Rich, you would have seen him come through at Bowes. So he made his debut yeah. age. Didn't play much there, though, did he? 14. Fourteen. But his debut at fourteen. Yeah. Obviously, Father Barry played. He's basically our Erling Haaland. Uh, Barry <laughs> played, and I wondered why didn't he go over? So if if he's good enough to play at fourteen for Bowes, he was certainly good enough to have headed over to the UK earlier. I wonder yeah. was that a paternal family it's decision? Stay here, let's not rush things, or or what was the thinking there? I wonder. I I, I think there is an age restriction on the the players you can actually take on board from uh, outside countries. Uh, so it would have been con conducive with that. Uh, as far as I remember, there was talk at the time that obviously there would have been interest um, from overseas, but he couldn't move until he was sixteen. OTB. AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? It's not like Maradona or Messi, where the ball is tied to the left foot. I always see the ball as something which is bouncing like an obedient, happy puppy at his feet. And if, if you really want to see him at his peak, the footage, unfortunately, is far, far worse than anything from 1917. It's in black and white. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. And you're very welcome back. Now, to celebrate the close ties between Ireland and Italy in football World Cups gone by, the Italian Institute of Culture in Dublin, with the support of the Embassy of Italy in Ireland, is bringing an exhibition to Cork and Dublin, which will showcase original material covering the 1990, 1994 and 2002 World Cups. Today at 6.15, the exhibition is called Chasing the Ball. It's a display of football stickers featuring Ireland and Italy at the World Cup. Uh, between 1990 and 2002 will be launched in the Printworks building in Dublin Castle. This free exhibition will remain open until the 22nd of January. And here in studio to officially open the exhibition in Dublin today is none other than Italy's Italian IT hero and the breaker of Ireland hearts, Toto Scilacci. We're also joined by Caterina Muratore, who's the events manager at the Italian Institute of Culture in Dublin. You're both very welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you. Toto, I'm looking at the Italian 90 book here, right, which we have, which is the Orbis World Cup collection one, and you're not even in it. I'm looking at the... Look. Nel, ah, nella non ci sono. No. No. Eh, questo è un errore, un errore grande. It's a big mistake. Che loro non immaginavano che io all'ultimo fosse uno dei convocati e quindi non erano programmati su questo. Okay, they weren't expecting him to be called for for the World Cup, so they weren't ready basically. So. Exactly. Yeah. Chiamerò la federazione. He will call the <laughs> Italian Federation. <laughs> <laughs> the World Cup Federation because there's a missing stickers. There's a story there though, right? You were very late into the squad for Italian 90. It was only at the very end. Yeah. Dicevano che effettivamente l'hanno convocata tardi per per sì, partecipare sì. ai mondiali. In effetti non avevano il tempo per poter fare la figurina. <laughs> There was enough time to, to publish the, the stickers. Uh, È un errore, come un errore. mai l'hanno chiamata così in ritardo? Eh, perché a giugno, quando è finito il campionato, oh, c'è stata come si chiama, la convocazione dei mm -hmm. 22 giocatori. Ok, just in June, uh, when the World, uh, Italian Championship ended, they, they called uh, Toto for the 
for the World Cup. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was very late. It was not expected. <laughs> no, it, wasn't, it was kind of uh, sudden. So Azalio Vicini rings and says, Toto, come and play in the World Cup? Or how did it happen? Come and come and come and come and attraverso la società c'è cioè stata i 22 convocati che dovevano partecipare mm-hmm. ai mondiali e tramite la società mi è arrivata la notizia mm-hmm. che ero uno dei 22 convocati mm-hmm. non è Quindi, stato l'allenatore a chiamarla no no no, no. no it wasn't, la società la Juve yeah it was uh, Juventus uh, that in, informed him of that it was not the, the team the, the, And the surprise a, a big surprise <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, you had been playing well in the previous season And è successo perché eh, giocava molto bene aveva giocato aveva fatto una buona stagione alla Juventus sì quell'anno 89-90 mh, ho fatto 21 gol mm-hmm. ho vinto la Coppa UEFA mm-hmm. Europa League eh, Coppa Italia e eh, in più <coughs> ero in grandissima forma yeah. mm-hmm. e quindi c'è stata la convocazione all'ultimo yeah it was a great season for him because he was playing in Juventus and uh, with that team they play, he did he scored 21 goals during the Italian Championship national <coughs> championship and they also won Coppa UEFA yeah. uh, UEFA Cup yeah. and yeah. Uh, Which, uh, Coppa Italia. Ah, and the Italian, uh, Italian Cup. Toto, are you, are you aware of how much we still talk about you in this country? Because you, bro- you broke our hearts, you broke Irish hearts. Parlano ancora di lei qui in Irlanda perché lei ha segnato un gol contro l'Irlanda che li ha distrutti praticamente. No, ma io non è la prima volta che vengo in Irlanda, mm-hmm. eh, quindi tante volte. E devo dire che mi trovo benissimo, mm-hmm. mi sento a casa. Ok, quindi, quindi sono non molto le simpa- faccio, no, 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 assolutamente. <ride> Quando un gesto è fatto eh, molto carino mm-hmm. e quindi uno lo deve accettare... Mm-hmm. Con accetta gli sì, 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 figurati, anzi, sono so, molto carini gli irlandesi. So he's very well aware of this because it's not the first time he's visiting Ireland, so uh, he's been talking with several people about this accident, I mean, uh, this, cor- that this goal that he scored against Ireland, so and he, he likes to have fun about it, but so he never fa- is, so oh yeah, fatto una he's aware of the dice. t-shirts, Fox <laughs> Killashi, <laughs> you know, anzi, in, se qualcuno me la regala me la porto he, he would love to receive that as a gift. Oh, we should get one. Yeah. <laughs> this is Was it Mick McCarthy? Mick McCarthy? Uh, no, no, it's the Fox Gilacho oh, t-shirt. Oh, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. 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 Apologies yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. no, that's all right. We can, we can say that. It's okay. We're allowed to say that. Um, a very famous moment in Irish pop culture. That and the Smithics ad also also very good. Um, you said, Mi sento a casa. You feel at home here. Yeah, no, that's, that's okay. That's good. We're, we're very welcoming. Uh, we wanted Shane has actually been practicing his Italian. You Great. have a you have a line. Uh, the, the line is the, uh, it's I rovinato i nostri sogni, but I, I don't know if that uh-huh. means uh-huh. you ruined our dreams. I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. But Toto, <laughs> you you ruined our dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Grazie mille. Purtroppo, purtroppo mi dispiace tanto perché diciamo che sono molto legato a, a, a la tifoseria irlandese. Mm-hmm. Perché sono molto simpatici, poi mh, hanno uno spirito vero di allegria mm-hmm. e di vivere questo calcio in maniera, come dire, con grande entusiasmo. Ok, quindi. so he's, uh, he's sorry about what happened because he's very, uh, he loves a lot uh, Irish uh, supporters of football because they are very, uh, a very joyful way of living uh, soccer and enthusiastic as well. So. Sì. Poi ha gio- allenato Trapattoni. And, and also Trapattoni was ah. here as team manager <laughs> for Ireland for a year, so that's another good link, When link you that we have. When you were playing for Juve and Italy in Italia 90, it's a golden era for Serie A. So uh, Van Basten, Hullet yes, Reichardt yes. at Milan, yes. at uh, Inter, it's Matthias and, and Brema. And yes. um, at Juventus, obviously, it's you. And um, who else plays for on, on that Juve team? Viali comes later, yeah. does he? Do you Magic play? Come? Eh, chi altri giocava alla Juve? Quando... Insieme a me giocava a... Allora, noi eravamo una squadra molto operaia, mm-hmm. non era una squadra molto forte. Con noi c'era Zavarok, mm-hmm. Ale- Alenikov, mm-hmm. eh, Rui Barros, mm-hmm. eh, Casiraghi, insomma non avevamo una, una oh, yeah. squadra... E Viali è arrivato dopo. Molto, no, Viali dopo. Yeah, Viali arrivato dopo. Viali after, yeah. And, and Baggio after. Yes, Baggio... Yeah. Dopo i mondiali Baggio ah, è arrivato. After the World Cup Baggio, yes, right, yeah. Baggio e, e, 
poi quel periodo oh, nel 90-91 era un periodo che il calcio veramente era uh, molto come dire eh, c'erano tanti ca- grandi campioni mm-hmm. da Maradona, Van Basse, Raikert mm-hmm. un periodo molto forte un, un periodo molto come dire, un periodo bello dove il calcio proprio mm-hmm. c'erano t- tanti, tanti campioni capito? Yeah. It was a great period for it, for soccer because there were many champions playing at that moment like there was Van Basten and Maradona Maradona, Maradona. yeah yeah sì, sì. so giocato insieme a Maradona exactly well play, af- after you beat Ireland you play Argentina mm. in the semi final and the Maradona documentary have you seen the movie the Maradona movie it's all about that kind of build up from uh, Naples and Maradona versus Italy mm-hmm. in the semi-final. What do you remember about the semi-final and Maradona? Beh, il ricordo, il ricordo più bello è quello di l'entusiasmo che c'era attorno alla nazionale. Eh, sapevamo di, di andare a giocare contro l'Argentina a Napoli e sapevamo che in parte la tifoseria del Napoli tifava mm-hmm. per Maradona. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. E questo un po' ci ha condizionato un po' ecco, l'entusiasmo e il rapporto che c'era, però abbiamo, abbiamo fatto una grande partita, tra l'altro vinciavamo 1-0 con mm. un gol mio e purtroppo per un errore di, un errore di Zenga, Walter Zenga che è uscito a vuoto e non siamo riusciti, insomma, mm-hmm. non siamo riusciti a, a superare la semifinale. Però l'entusiasmo, l'affetto, la gente, insomma, eh, era. Insomma, ci sentivamo veramente supportati. Mm Purtroppo è capitato di giocare a Napoli contro Mm. la contro l'Argentina con Maradona. Sì, so it was a big event for them, of course, because they were uh, very enthusiastic and excited about the whole um, uh, match uh, happening and they were playing uh, against Argentina in Naples, where like uh, this, the, the fans were kind of supporting uh, Italy, but also they were supporting mm-hmm. Maradona. So it was, it was a mixed, you know, uh, public they had there. So there you could actually feel the tension a little bit. Uh, but in the end, they did their best. Like he scored the goal uh, that was leading them to winning the, the match, but then there was a mistake. I know, uh, and, uh, Walter Zenga uh, makes a yeah. mistake and you've yeah, uh, obviously Zenga, never yeah. forgotten. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah which is the so same, yeah. He went who, who, was, who was your favorite striker that you ever played with? I know you had a great relationship with Baggio, but mm-hmm. who was your favorite striker to play uh, alongside? Il giocatore preferito con, con cui ha giocato. Ma io ho giocato con grandi campioni, quindi il periodo 90, 91, 92 c'erano dei straordinari giocatori. Oggi il calcio è cambiato molto mm-hmm. rispetto ai miei tempi. Eh, ho giocato con grandi campioni, eh, però un, uno in particolare, eh, diciamo che ritengo che sia stato uno dei centrocampisti più forti, è eh, Roberto Baggio. Mm-hmm. Roberto Baggio è un giocatore straordinario, ho avuto la fortuna di giocarci insieme, però alla fine eh, ho giocato con grandi campioni mm-hmm, insomma, mm-hmm. anche av- av- avversari mm-hmm. so he's, he played with several uh, champions and and also <coughs> like they were playing with him and also against him you know but uh, the favorite um, you could say Roberto Bad do you uh, do you have any regrets about your your Italy career because your <coughs> seven goals in 16 games across two years a, a remarkable two year period but Were there any regrets that it didn't go on longer and maybe last into to USA in 94? And ha uh, qualche um, rimorso sulla sua carriera in Italia che è durata comunque bre- breve, bre- breve. È stato un po' breve <coughs> da quando ha poi partecipato alla, alle nazionali del No, 94. io sono molto felice della mia carriera calcistica, quindi sicuramente in, 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 nel campionato italiano ci sono arrivato molto tardi, che mm-hmm. avevo 24 anni, 25 anni, è stata molto breve, eh, però molto intensa. Mm-hmm. Quindi ho, ho, ho ottenuto dei risultati in, in giro di 3-4 anni, risultati importanti, risultati che nemmeno io potevo mai immaginare. Mm-hmm di vincere la classifica dei cannonieri mondiale, migliori giocatori mondiali, secondo pallone d'oro, insomma sono cose che tu 
non puoi mai immaginare. Uh-huh. È stata breve, però intensa. Ci sono molti giocatori che giocano oh, nel nostro campionato per vent'anni uh-huh. e non sono nemmeno riconosciuti. Io uh-huh. grazie ai mondiali, grazie a tutto riesco a girare il mondo e uh-huh. sono conosciuto da, da tutti e questo mi fa un grande piacere. Ecco. Uh-huh. So it was actually a short career because he entered the Italian Championships at a, at a later uh, age, he was mm. around 24, which is kind of uh, considered not old, but you know, in that uh, kind of uh, type of, um, in that field. Uh, so, but he, he worked very hard, so he reached very uh, high goals uh, during that uh, short period. So he's very happy because um, anyway, he did reach uh, a lot of um, important uh, goals. Like uh, um, during the, the World Cup, he was uh, like uh, the leading um, goal scorer. Goal scorer, sorry. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And golden and ball. And, yeah, golden he went second yeah. for the golden ball so he actually so he's very proud of uh, what 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 yeah. he did and compared to other people <coughs> the, the other football players that maybe play for a longer uh, career but receive um, kind of um, uh, get to less uh, you know acknowledgements so is is very happy a golden ball a golden mm. boot i mean you know mm-hmm. like uh, it's amazing cioè sono dei riconoscimenti eccezionali il fatto che è arrivato secondo per Beh, se avessimo vinto i mondiali sicuramente avrei vinto pure il pallone d'oro. Mm-hmm. Eh, quindi l'unica cileggina un po' così che mi manca era quello di poter, non ho potuto assaporare, la, alzare la Coppa del Mondo. Eravamo lì, avevamo squadrone. Purtroppo il calcio è fatto anche di episodi, mm-hmm. noi abbiamo perso per un episodio. Però diciamo che a livello personale ho fatto delle cose bellissime, strepitose, eh, che non, ho, non potevo mai immaginare. Mm-hmm. Però sono le cose che ti porterai per tutta la vita. Mm-hmm. A distanza di 32 anni ancora sono veramente riconosciuto e voluto bene da tutti. E mm-hmm. questo per me... È una, è una, una, una grande cosa, una bella cosa, ecco. Mm-hmm. Poter andare in giro il mondo e essere riconosciuti a distanza di 32 anni, insomma. Non è, non è, non è una cosa da tutti i giorni. Mm-hmm. È, è bello, è bello e speriamo di che possa continuare ancora per 30 anni, mm-hmm. se saremo vivi, ecco. <ride> sì. So the only actual regret is that they didn't win the Italy 90, of course, because that would be would have been the, the top of uh, you know, that, that part of the Uh, of the championship, uh, but is still um, they did reach. Uh, they did uh, reach uh, loads of uh, big goals. So and still he is remembered for what happened like 32 years ago. So that's that's really amazing. It really is. Um, <coughs> lots of people saying you look great and congratulations and well done in our in our comments. But one that I want to ask about. Also, Toto was a great singer. Oh, we didn't know. Uh, lei canta. No, no? <laughs> l'unica cosa che non so fare è cantare. No, he's not. <laughs> no, 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 no. Io ho cantato con i piedi. He was con i singing piedi. with his feet. Singing with his feet, yeah. yeah. Fake news. <laughs> uh, very good. Well, Katerina, where is the exhibition? Where, where can people go? Uh, so it's a Printworks building in Dublin Castle and it will be on until the 22nd of, uh, of, Jan- of uh, January. And uh, it's open, uh, like the launch will be today, as you said, and it will be open Monday to, fri- uh, to Saturday uh, until the 22nd from 10 a.m. to <coughs> 5.30 uh, p.m. Okay, well, it's absolutely mm-hmm. brilliant. Toto, thank you so much for coming in today and congratulations on a great career. Thank you. Grazie per essere qui. No, grazie a voi. È stato, no, no, come dire, pochi minuti, ma è stato molto carino, bello. Puoi vedere tutta questa... <laughs> Eh, he, he's saying bello. thanks and he enjoyed a lot his experience and uh, he's a great studio. Excellent. Uh, bello, Thank you. Bello, molto bello. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, right, make sure you go along to that. As, as we said, it's in uh, the Printworks in Dublin Castle and it's open from today. Uh, that is pretty much all we have time for. We're going to play out with some goodness from the football show last night. It's the best of the football show from last night. We're back tomorrow. Alan Quillen in the studio, Ken Doherty and Nason Racing driver James Rowe will all join us in the studio. We should mention Mr. Evan Ferguson. I know we touched on him in the news round, but uh, people coming to us just on the football show, I'm sure. Uh, curious for your thoughts. 18 years of age, he's now scored in back to back Premier League games. Uh, Federico Makeda from Manchester United, the last uh, player that young to score in uh, two consecutive games. So, also a cautionary tale. 
and uh, Ferguson hit the post in the first half it was a really good left footed effort then on 52 minutes he scored his goal uh, lots of composure and then he was involved in the third goal he gets an assist although it was um, routine enough admittedly but uh, he gets an assist nonetheless uh, this guy's been coming for quite some time debut for Bowes at 14 we were wondering in the news round Kenny about his journey over to England Dan McDonald was in touch he was very much on top of these things yeah. so the interesting thing with Evan Ferguson is uh, the rule very much for Ferguson's generation as opposed to previous generations is you do not go to England until you're 18 the reason he was able to go at 16 is that his mother is English so his father Barry professional footballer met the mother in Coventry that's right yeah and therefore he was able to go over at 16 right. as opposed to suddenly maybe going over now yeah so maybe a blessing in disguise there that was the loophole uh, otherwise he would have been very much on Irish soil until he was 18 so that's been his trajectory I mean you can't think it hurt akin to Haaland at a slightly uh, lesser level it can't hurt to have a father who's been around the block and has a yeah. sense of the game and this is incredibly exciting. Um, I know I'm asking you to repeat yourself, but you've watched Ferguson play uh, numerous games for Ireland. You've seen him come through. There is a huge amount to like about this kid, even at 18, without heaping more pressure on his shoulders. Yeah, no, I've, I'm not saying I've watched every minute of every game that he's he played at international level. Certainly the last 21, uh, 21 campaign, I had a look at him. Yeah, you can't help but be impressed with him. You know, you don't have to be a student of the game to look at that kid and say, well... Some talent there, you know, it takes us all the boxes. That kind of physical maturity, which is obviously the standout thing uh, straight away, is why he's obviously made the impact as quickly a, a, as he has. Like he's got a, you know, he's got a man's, he's got a man's frame physically can uh, look after himself. Uh, technically, yeah, good. You know, someone that that kind of uh, uh, size not always a given yeah. in terms of the, that short kind of uh, force touch. How you kind of travel with the ball, carry the ball, that type of thing, but. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problems there whatsoever. I suppose the biggest challenge, which you can see, looking at a football pitch, as I said, he ticks a lot of boxes. Yeah. Just in terms of what's going on between his uh, between his ears, but even then, you look at you know the the quality of runs that he's making, his kind of uh, movement. I probably, um, as a comparison, look at him and maybe Aaron uh, Aaron Connolly at a younger age. Aaron kind of exploded onto the scene, but I looked at Aaron at a young age and always felt he needs to learn the game in terms of his movement. Uh, you know where he runs timing of his runs kind of game understanding even when kind of Aaron broke into the kind of Brighton team mm. uh, and even with the Ireland team I felt he's still got a bit of a way to to go here uh, whereas Evan's a little bit different you know I just feel as if just sees things a bit early makes the right decisions in terms of when to drop to receive or kind of when to spin kind of space around him so that's all good Joe you know what I mean it really is right. and now at the moment just in terms of now confidence off the back, I know it's been only two games, but you come at you come in at that level, and you score two goals, um, as he has done, and yeah. all of a sudden, whoosh. So I suppose the challenge from now, and we talk about his dad, Barry. I'm sure he's been huge in terms of development up until now. But it, for me, it's now is just as important. Now he's now he's made the breakthrough. He's getting the attention. It's all coming his way, and say, oh, this lad, he's going to this and that. Quality me, you, everybody else, sharing him a kind of compliment. So it's just as important now for his dad and that circle of people, people around him just to keep him a little bit kind of grounded and keep him, uh, you know, uh, heading in the in the right direction and just keep, you know, keep things clear in his head in terms of why he's got this far in his development, what he needs to do mm. to keep progressing and moving forward. But he's very exciting, very exciting player to watch. It's great, isn't it? It's great news. Yeah, no, it was great. Uh, it is worth mentioning that Evan Ferguson's Brighton uh, did beat Everton 4-1. Booze at half time, booze at full time. Sack the board. Booze for all the goals. Only thing, that's the only consolation for Frank. I mean, Sack the board, not Frank. There are certainly uh, uh, guns being aimed at uh, Mashiri, Ken Wright as well uh, today over the last 24 hours. Paul Robinson, for instance, I saw on Five Live because we didn't see the game in full, but he said Everton embarrassing one of their worst performances. He said they haven't a clear structure or plan, defensively easy to break down, the poorest I've seen Everton this season. And I don't know if you saw the opening goal, but genuinely, the, the defending of Patterson and Cody for what was just a simple ball out of the left-hand side, both of them coming across, and uh, just uh, Matoma, I think it was, just cuts inside both. Not even at a, a high speed. It was, it was actually an odd goal yeah. to see at this level. The weird thing is that Everton against City went to five at the back, and uh, certainly on match of the day, Danny Murphy, amongst others, was making the point that uh, it allowed them to have split strikers two strikers up front Calvert-Lewin back they were very solid didn't give up many chances to City this this is something to build on and then whoosh 
uh, 4-1 at Goodison. So I don't know where this leaves Lampard. They've got Manchester United in the Cup at the weekend and... Looking well, I, can't, I, think, I don't think you can shove him under a bus because like you say, if you look at the performance against uh, Manchester City and that was a different challenge and tactically it was a different setup, and it really worked for him. I liked to had a look at the team, was working on the game against Manchester right. City. I liked the setup from the very start, that back three, Godfrey coming in. And if you look at the two centre halves, uh, Cody, I mentioned that already in Tarkowski, decent players, good yeah. good box defenders, I'd call them in terms of defending around their box, kind of read the game well and you know, defend crosses quite well, etc. etc. And that suited against Manchester City, mm. that kind of deep defensive block. I, the midfield three were fantastic. Or Nana was missing, I think he was a big miss. You don't know his kind of physicality and the kind of dynamism he brings in centre midfield. Him, Gay, and Awobi were out, outstanding. They could get around, they got around the May tackles, they covered the ground, and they had the pace to break out from that deep defensive block. Oh, well, and good saying, yeah, retreat to the edge of your 18 yard box and let's hit teams on the counter attack. But you know, you need to have pace in the team, yeah. people who can take the ball individually up the pitch or travel quickly over distance like 20 30 yards. And they had that to a certain extent with Calvert Lewin, although he's very ring rusty. Demarai Gray can do it in possession of the ball. And Iwobi's phenomenal. That midfield three just continually like a running machine. So it was perfect against Manchester City. Just feel as if there's limitations in terms of when they've got to step out of that deep defensive block and take the game to the opposition and come up the pitch. Then I think you see maybe small deficiencies in that defensive line. Cody in particular, not the quickest over the ground task. Koski's not a, a sprinter either. Patterson, you're right, still young, developing. I think he's a very good player. Mm. But you're right, made a couple of individual errors uh, uh, the other night. So it's not perfect, but I like what he did in the summer in terms of his recruitment. Onana gave for me straight away. Yeah, I like that because they were soft. Had a soft centre in centre midfield uh, uh, previous to that. Dwight McNeil came in. I thought, yeah, a bit of a creative edge there. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, let's not forget Anthony Gordon's not uh, fit at the moment mm. I think Cody and Tarkovsky has helped them in that central defence of areas because they were porous there with uh, Kane and Mina uh, last year so I, I actually think I'd give him a bit of credit he's looked but at the team because it's very fashionable to bash Lampard he's seen as silver spoon kid and he's, get, he's, he's ah, been, given easy, chan- been given chances yeah, it's that easy. others in the game haven't been given but you, you rate what he's done as a manager okay? Yeah, I, I had a bit of sympathy for him at Chelsea when he went in there. People said he, he didn't earn it, Ugh, whatever. Anyway, he got the opportunity. It was a massive, yeah, massive club, lack of experience. And went in there at a difficult time. The transfer from Berger wasn't it? So he's yeah. bringing a couple of the, uh, uh, younger Tommy players. Tommy Abraham and these came yeah, through. I thought Mason Mount he brought through. Yeah, yeah. Mason Mount, of course, yeah. So, yeah, you could argue in terms of, yeah, they, they pulled the trigger. Could have been a bit more patient with him, possibly so. It didn't happen. So, yeah, and he's got his opportunity at uh, Everton. I just always felt Lampard very bright for me. Even when he finished, you could see it when he played. Joe on the pitch a very bright operator because of his limitations himself as a player you know the type of player that he uh, be, uh, became was phenomenal and he understood his strengths his weaknesses you know you could see how he moved on the, on the pitch very smart uh, operator even in terms of his punditry when he came uh, finished football really enjoyed listening to him speak right. in terms of his eye for the game so that's all that encourages it gives you a bit of optimism and you know if you're looking to maybe put this man in position um, at a, as a manager at a football club so yeah and even at Everton I feel as if the players who have come in yeah I'm yeah I'm I think he understands the way Everton have to play some people are uh, a little bit of criticism out there well you can't play you know possession based at Everton you have, it's got to be high energy front foot stuff that's what they demand you're a fool if you think he can play Kate them any other way but I think he realises that and that's why he got the likes of Gay, Onana and Awobi in the centre midfield like tenacious, aggressive, mm. high energy players like back to front. These aren't players who are like at their best and retaining possession of the football and just so, hold them possession no, for I take long all those periods. Points. What, what's the biggest reason then for you that after 18 games they're in the relegation? Well zone? I think a big reason for me centre forward Calvert-Lewin he must be okay. absolutely tearing his head out. They carried Calvert-Lewin for the, for the whole time he was on the pitch against Manchester City he carried their centre forward for the whole of the game and still came out of that game uh, with a draw so for me he started towards the end of last season the impact that he made now you could say well that's his responsibility where's the, where's the cover he spent money on Mopay but he's a totally different player he's more of a squad player so that's the killer for me I think he maybe took a calculated risk in getting Calvert-Lewin onto the pitch this season and keeping it fit and it hasn't happened so that's a problem for them is it perfect the other end in terms of the central defensive party no I don't think it's perfect could they do it better individually sent to halves yeah but that costs a lot of money mm-hmm. I'm not sure they have it so I can see what he's putting together it makes sense to me in terms of the team that he's putting together now that hurt the other night uh, don't get me wrong but I'd be reasonably encouraged generally what I've said I think he gets it 
Lampard. Correct. I think he gets it in terms of what he needs to put out on the pitch there and what the Everton fans uh, demand. And I see that coming together slowly. Ultimately, whether he gets the investment, if he gets like 50 million to spend, he might have to make it a big decision at the end of the year, Cav- get Cavett Lewin out. Maybe in reflection, they could have should have sold him a year and a half ago. Yeah. Spurs have been 40, 50 million and got a to- top class struggle who they could keep fit week in, uh, week out. But that's by and by, that's gone now. So I think he's he's got a couple of awkward, uh, he's in an awkward position, but he may not get the time. I think you're right, that result hurts, but I just think there was a bit of money in the bank. If I was the owners looking at that Manchester City game, I would have been thought, oh yeah, I like what I'm seeing okay. here. Uh, Man City are always interesting. They play Chelsea tomorrow night. So they drew with Everton, as discussed, and they beat Leeds post-World Cup resumption. I mean, weird against Everton, Aki and Rico Lewis were the full backs, Walker and Cancelo on the bench. Presumably, there are issues there with injury management and minutes, but uh, it seemed odd. The other, um, maybe more questionable decision, or the decision to get your thoughts on Phil Foden, uh, has played 37 minutes in their last three games, one start in their last six. So, this predates the World Cup as well. It's been Grealish and Mares of late on the uh, wings. So what Guardiola said of Grealish over Foden just of late is, I see something on the pitch in the training sessions. I use my intuition to use Jack in these games because he gives us extra passes. And then, not talking specifically about Foden, but I mean, you wonder who else he's talking about. He um, was talking about body language. says, I'm looking at body language. The older I get in management, Body language in training sessions, in matches, everything. You can't play well when body language isn't correct. That's one of the main factors I go with when it comes to selection because everybody's skills are so good. So people, again, are looking at Foden not being in the team and saying, well, maybe this is directed mm. at Foden. I have to say, I've never once looked at Phil Foden's body language and thought he was anything but committed. I, like The man has never not sprinted to press a ball out of possession in his yeah, life. Is, yeah, but this, this is the modern game. Odd. Joe, you hear a lot of this in terms of you know how players train uh, during the week. It just wasn't prevalent in my day when I played. You could literally... Maybe I was a little bit guilty of it at myself, myself at times towards the latter stages of my career in terms of thinking, oh, physically I don't feel great. This is like a Monday early in the week and just training at, at 60%. Like, you you know didn't like I mean? Saturdays either from my mind. <laughs> uh, That's I, a fair point. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's there's, a very fair point. Uh, there's something more... Go- this doesn't make sense. Foden not on the team. No. So for me, the argument isn't oh, Grealish or Foden. You know how I feel about Foden. For me, they both play. And I don't know. I don't know what it's going to have to take for Manchester City or England to, in terms of the the qualities that Phil Foden has, for somebody to, for the penny to drop and say this is one of the outstanding players of his generation. Tell you what, here's an idea. Let's play him in his best position. What about if we play him in his best position and see how good he can be? Because for me, his best position, from what I've been told and what I see myself, how he's been uh, developed in Manchester City. In the Manchester City uh, system, they play it all through the uh, U team and all, and all the way down. He's a left-sided eight. You know, City play with a midfield three, a holding six and two eights, a left-sided eight and a right-sided eight behind that front, front three. Mm. Foden, for me, is a left-sided eight. That's when he's at his best. So you're saying it's, Rodri, De Bruyne, Foden? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, then you get Grealish in the team, uh, left side of a three, Mares, Haaland, you could, you could argue Alvarez, you it, yeah. Cole Palmer into the equation, uh, uh, whatever. So for me, that's the yeah. way forward. That's the way forward for England. That's how England uh, missed a, a B in the summer against France. In that second half, England took control of that game for 25 minutes in the second half, took the, uh, the ball off the French, but couldn't fashion enough clear-cut yeah. opportunities because for me... They hadn't got enough attacking threat on the pitch in that period. Mm. They needed to get Foden on the pitch with Bellingham in those number eight positions with Declan Rice in behind and get Grealish and Rashford off the left-hand side for that period of the game. We'll never know. It's easy for me to say talk is cheap. But I think there was a better chance with those players on the pitch and those areas of the pitch for England to go and take that game away from France in that in, in that part of the game. So for me, well, look at City. So for me, that's the solution. The argument is that Grealish or Foden doesn't stand up for yeah. me. Because Foden, Joe... When he comes deep into central areas, receives the ball and starts travelling with the ball, defenders take a step back because yeah. they know this lad travels with speed at the ball, slaloms tackles, he frightens people to death. I don't see it. I don't see another English player like him. I said it before, I haven't seen another English player since Wiltshire who's got that ability, dribbling ability, close ball control and has got that turn of pace over 10 yards. Just see it. Yeah. 
and he, he, he's, it's difficult to do that when you're playing left of a three up front because you're higher up the pitch you're coming back towards the ball Joe you're playing on the half turn you're coming into areas of the pitch tight little pockets yeah. and that's why when he talks about Greed he's making more pass I can understand that because say Everton for example that deep defensive block players behind the ball nice compact shape how are you going to break that down well it's clever little combinations little one two touch passes little reverse passes you know up in the tempo slowing it mm. and Greed for me is probably better than that a folding, folding better in 1v1 situations more dynamical score you more goals but for me you get them both on the pitch yeah. and uh, I, and we haven't seen it for Manchester no. City yet and we haven't seen it for England yeah it's very strange it's stra- it is very strange and uh, again the body language point may have nothing to do with Foden he could be talking about somebody else I've never seen Foden with bad body language on a pitch. Now, maybe on a Monday or Tuesday post World Cup, he's messing around a little bit. Yeah, but bit. this is what ma- managers, but this seems to be this is the consensus. Managers won't accept that during the week. A drop off in, in performance during the week, that's not acceptable. That seems to be, you hear a lot of that mantra, don't you, in terms of, you know, train as you play, attitude and train and drop. Well, like, that's unacceptable. Like, you know, almost as if, you know, you know, I have to come down with the hammer. You know, you've got to be made an example of. I also don't see. Yeah, it. it's in, it's interesting. Yeah, because like I said, it was totally different. You probably experienced. It. I think we've all done. Like, you know what I mean? In terms of the old attitude of he turns up, I'll suffer anything Monday to Friday. But I know on a Saturday he'll turn up and give me the performance. I trust him. Mm. I trust him to, so he can manage himself through the, a week. Now this is different. Maybe a twenty-three year old to a thirty-three year old. Don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, he turns up on a Saturday. I pretty forgive him anything. But I think you're right. I can't see Phil Fowens like walking around giving it Larry Large no, on the training to pitch, Jordan. He loves it's football Jordan too much. He loves football too much to do that. I think it's like us with you. Two to seven, we put up with anything, but then we get the magic seven to ten. <laughs> Uh, we're, pretty much, we're pretty much out of time um, just give us a quick word on Manchester United because you saw them last night that was it oh I can't do it forget it I I'll saw, speak to you next month I, saw I can't give you a quick word ish 3-0 it looked like they cruised you were saying they were still a touch open so it wasn't like touch a touch open session. you watched Ten Hag after the game there's a couple of shots from him on the pitch after the game happy. and he's got his arm David De Gea I wouldn't say he's shouting him, but he's not happy because he knows this, this can't happen again okay. that second half performance how open that they were how easily Bournemouth got at them and got through them down the sides and crosses and created chances. He knows he has to he knows he has to rectify that. But probably similar to Liverpool actually in that respect. Yeah. I'm not too sure he has the solution necessarily in those central midfield areas. Is big Casemiro plus. not Mr. Not by shut himself. Down. Not, not by himself. himself. Who was with part him? of the solution? Who was with him, Ericsson? Ericsson was playing down. and Fernandez is a ten who just didn't turn up okay. for the first kind of excuse me, uh, Fernandez played off the right, played can right they, three. Um, against the bigger teams. Can they get away with Casemiro and Ericsson as the two? I don't think so. Yeah. And certainly not with uh Fernandez in front. For me, you take your pick at the moment. Probably Liverpool, similar to Liverpool's uh, sticky plaster, what do you do at the moment? It's probably a, a midfield two of uh Casemiro and maybe McTominay or you could argue Casemiro Mac Tomini and Fred in midfield three and you yeah. sacrifice the ten but then you sacrifice Bruno and Ericsson if you're talking about getting one of them into the team for me Ericsson plays as a ten at the moment ahead of Bruno right. and you take your pick or Fred uh, Fred or McTominay alongside Casemiro in a two as good as he is Casemiro needs a little bit of help he's not the quickest over the ground we know no. not the greatest athlete still reading it well but oh, just still fantastic yeah. intercept and, did, did, and he's a distributor and a finisher. He's a really good player. And a finisher yeah. as well. This is what I'm talking about. So people, yeah, you're right. So I've always thought Casemiro, I've always, whenever he gets in the opposition half of the, the pitch, he makes things happen. Mm. He produces. He's productive. Mm. So this kind of tag of a holding midfield player does actually quite stand up because I don't think he's got all the attributes to play in, in holding midfield. Like, yes, reads it well, interceptions, great. But bit, very similar to Fabinho in terms of how he moves over the ground. Mm. Very clunky. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But when he gets into the last third, for me, I'll be encouraging him a bit higher up the pitch. Yeah. More, I'll be getting more of an orthodox uh, uh, holding midfield to play alongside him and actually encourage him up the pitch a little bit because we've seen how productive he can be. Interesting. Three seconds, did you, what did you say? That was pretty three, good going. Oh, no, no, we'll take that. Yeah. Uh, so Aston Villa have equalised against Wolves. 1-0 is where we are in 95 minutes. Full times in the other games. Spurs 4-0 winners against Palace. Leeds and West Ham 2-2 and Nottingham Forest 1-0 winners against Southampton. Just gone full time to Villa Park. So 1-0 draw there. DB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Off the ball. And he also said to ask him about the Hummer golf buggy I saw him driving in Portugal. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that.